and gentlemen, we're going to get started. Uh, we'll call the order of the City Council Successor Agency to the Redevelopment Agency of the City of San Carlos, February 13, 2017. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Changes to the order of, agenda, uh, order of the agenda. I have one. I would like to move 7B, uh, uh, the park one, to ahead of 6. So, well, thank you. I thank you. So, so, Siri said hello. So it'll, be, it'll come right after the uh, consent calendar. 7B will come right after f- uh, 5. Any other changes? Staff? No other Police? changes this evening. Thank you. Okay. All right. So number four is public comment, but this is for comment that are items not on the posted agenda. Do you have any cards, uh, Crystal? Does anyone wish to speak on items not on the posted agenda tonight? All right, we'll move on. Number five is approval of consent calendar. Consent calendar items are considered to be routine and will be uh, enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless members of the council, staff, or public request specific items to be removed for separate action. So are there items that wish to be removed? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull items D and G. D and G. Okay. Any others? All right, um, I would like to, and I think perhaps someone else, I would like to, uh, which one is the uh, one that I can't find here? Um, the formula business, yes. Um, Crystal, I, I want to vote, uh, vote no on C, so uh, I'm going to ask for a motion uh, tonight for A, B, E, and F at this point. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll make that motion to approve A, B, E, and F, and uh, I move to adopt ordinance number 1518 and ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending the zoning ordinance title 18 of the San Carlos Municipal Code modifying the definition of formula businesses. And Mr. I apologize, but that's one of the ones that I want to vote no on. I think we have to do a separate one on that, so I apologize. Or, you want to, or not? I, I think just procedurally, what I understood, Mr. Mayor, you were um, doing was indicating that you were not, were not. I got two votes, though, Mr. Rubens. I'm going to vote yes on A, B, D, and E. Uh, uh, through the chair. I'm sorry. I misunderstood what you were yeah, yeah, trying okay. to do. So okay. since I'm voting against C, I didn't mean to cut you off, but C is going to be the second motion. That's fine. That's an appropriate way to do it. Okay. Thanks, sir. Sure. All right. So A, B. E and F? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion on those items? If not, roll call, please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. And Mayor Vasily? Yes. All right, so, Mr. <laughs> All right, I'll move to adopt. Thank you. Ordinance number 1518, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending the zoning ordinance, Title 18 of the San Carlos Municipal Code, modifying the definition of formula businesses and making permanent regulations on formula business uses in the downtown core area, and the 50% reduction for, uh, for conditional use permit applications for such uses set to expire on February uh, 28, 2017. Is there a second? Second. Second. It's moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? No. Mayor Gaselli? No. All right, thank you. And we will get to, um, I'm sorry, your two were uh, D and C. D and G. D and G. D and G. D and G. We'll get to those at the end of the meeting. All right, uh, we will now move to 7B, which is consideration of adopting a resolution approving the master plan for North Crestview Park. Ms. Newby? <coughs> sorry, Cameron. Good evening, Mayor Grassilli and members of the council. Amy Newby, Acting Parks and Recreation Director. Um, Tonight, I would like to introduce Mark Slichter with Calendar Associates, who will take us all through the master planning process for North Crestview Park specifically summarizing input from the various community meetings, how the conceptual design ideas evolved throughout the process, and the outcomes of the public process this past year. And with that, I'd just like to welcome up Mark. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you.
Thank you, Amy, and, and uh, thank you, council members and public, for this opportunity to be here this evening. Um, I want to take a little bit of time here to kind of catch you up. Uh, the last time we met was back in March, and uh, and so what I my plan to do this evening is to basically, uh, in chronological fashion, um, take you through the the um, process we've gone through and the input that we've received and and where we are now. So the. Um, I share this with you. Um, this basically captures uh, all the way back to when we met last and then the subsequent meetings. And so I'm going to speak to each of these meetings. Uh, but I, I do think it's kind of helpful to uh, have that context. It's, I, I know for me, when there's, a lot of, when there's a fair amount of time that elapses between uh, events, uh, it can, the, the, the investment that's been made to this point uh, might be easy to miss. Um, so I'm going to start with a ref kind of a quick refresher on the, the site itself. North Crestview Park uh, is four acres in size. Uh, it's about 330 feet from top to bottom in that aerial photo there, and then 450 feet in length. The, uh, the front of the site is sloping the front third of the, slight, uh, of the site, um, and there's a a total of about 50 feet of grade differential between Crestview Drive to the back of the site, and most of that happens in that first first third of the site. Um, neighbors to the north and to the south, so on, on that area, that would be to the left and to the right, and then uh, Vista Park is in close proximity uh, to the site. Um, it's roughly comparable in size to uh, Crestview Park, so um, I think that's kind of a useful point of reference um, in, in thinking about it. Everybody's familiar with Crestview. Um, some quick images. Uh, this is the, the view from the street. Um, and, uh, and looking to the west, um, this is the southern edge. Uh, so you can see some homes along that southern edge. Uh, the northern edge, um, as I made the point I made in, in previous meetings, is that um, the northern and southern edges are different in the way they relate to the the neighborhoods. The southern edge is basically more of a uh, condition where the elevation of the park and the elevation of the residences is the same. On the northern edge, the the residences are uh, substantially lower uh, than the elevation of the site. Um, this is uh, hopefully familiar. Um, this was a, a product of our initial community meeting, and in that meeting we did not come forward with concepts, uh, plans. We showed um, the site, we talked about uh, different uses that could happen there, and essentially our intent in that first meeting was to is was to get the input of the community there and this is a product uh, essentially of that first meeting where um, a, a preference for passive uses was expressed and so what we have here is uh, primarily trails, um, some uh, more developed than others. Um, and little in the way of development within the site. Uh, a couple of areas that are, are more enhanced, uh, which would be the memorial overlook, and then the uh, and then the meadow area. In terms of the kinds of um, improvements we were contemplating at the time, is uh, as shown in these images. And essentially, there's three. Um, uh, categories of uh, trail. The one on the top left, that image is what we were anticipating would be a means of access onto the site uh, for emergency vehicles and that sort of thing to get up the slope and onto the site. Uh, the image to the right of that, so the top right image would be the kind of pathway that we could put in to create an accessible path, accessible to persons of all abilities. And then there would also be, as you see the lower left, some single track type trail that would allow access to more of the site. Um, that's, that's actually uh, Edgewood. Uh, 
actually, I'm sorry about that. I'm not, not sure. It might, might be Windy Hill. The bottom right image is the is the um, a suggestion as to the kind of treatment that we could um, take, or the kind of approach we could take uh, to the overlook areas. Um, I've kind of gone right by. I, I've talked about the geography of the site. I haven't talked much about the character of the site. Um, most folks who've had a chance to visit have some sense of it. It is one of the. I think it's pretty close to the highest point in the city. Um, so it's it's a its most dominant feature would be the the views that you have up there, um, out towards the bay and also to the west. Uh, so you know we want to capitalize on that when we propose things like overlooks. So we we came to the um, uh, council. Uh, on on uh, March 28th, and we shared um, that initial concept, and we received. We've kind of um, summarized the input that we received in the meeting here, um, and and that was that we look at some other uses, potential for more active uses, uh, that we that we uh, go back to the community and get some more input, and uh, that we make sure to cons to uh, preserve the uh, the character of the site. And uh, that meeting um, uh, was the first time that the uh, passive use concept had been presented. Uh, so what we did is we took it, the same concept, uh, back to the community. And this was on July 6th. And we presented the concept. And um, the general um, consensus in that meeting was that uh, passive uses were preferred, um, that uh, there were some concerns by the neighbors, um, I guess on both sides, I think more so to the, to the south side, uh, about how that edge is treated and the concern with uh, uh, people in the park and the proximity to private property. And, uh, and then we did get some input about the potential of, uh, of exploring active uses or a suggestion that we explore more active uses. Um, so uh, from there, we went to the commission and essentially we presented a couple of concepts. One is simply a refinement of the passive use plan and that's, that's what you see here. And then um, in addition to that, we presented one that looked at uh, more active uses and the, the thought, what, what um, basically a large field that could accommodate a lot of different uses. Uh, soccer comes immediately to mind, but a large square field can, uh, has, a fair, has flexibility. And so going hand in hand with that are other improvements that would be required of the site, such as vehicular access up onto the site, um, a, a restroom building, uh, turnaround, parking, um, those uh, kinds of enhancements. And so more along these lines, the image to the right you may recognize, that's actually Crestview Park today. So there's a restroom and parking, uh, that kind of a treatment. And then soccer uh, or other uh, uses that could be um, uh, provided for on a large flat turf area. Um, <clears throat> coming away from that meeting, um, the suggestion was that we look at active uses, but something maybe uh, as an alternative to um, what we had shown in the in the meeting. So, so um, maybe not a large uh, athletic field, but something something else, um, and uh, more of a blend of uses. Um, with the thought being that we try to balance um, balance the uses on the site, the passive and the active uses on the site. Uh, but the, the feedback that we received again uh, was that the the passive was um, the the preference of the majority of the attendees uh, in that meeting. Um, so. Uh, we came back to the commission, uh, this is on October 5th, and presented another concept, and this one does not have the athletic field. Instead of that, we've got more of a hard court area. Um, and you could, you, this is 
essentially comparable to the hardcore area that you have at uh, Crestview Park. Uh, I, I know that has some value there because we, we worked with that community some on the, the renovation. But um, flat areas are, are, um, have, have value in a community where there is so much topography. And so that was uh, what we were exploring here. This has a much smaller turf area, not big enough to accommodate any sort of a league play, but just more of a passive turf area and, uh, and a play, uh, play area. So some supporting images that go with that um, play equipment. Uh, a smaller hard, uh, hard court area, um, those kinds of improvements. Um, input that we received at that meeting included um, looking at active uses, uh, uh, going back to look at active uses, could we put something, could we put a smaller field on the site and what would the potential of that be? Uh, Again, the, the, the sentiment of the majority of the attendees was that the passive use plan was, was preferred. So we came, here we go, um, commission meeting number three on November 30th. Um, it was an attempt to have a little bit more of a mixed use. This is a smaller field. This is 150 feet by 210 feet. So that's a basically a U12 at, at most. Um, with an, with the thought that the area to the to the south or to the left um, could be undeveloped, leaving it more uh, in its natural state, um, and we got a little bit more of a kind of a, a buffer by virtue of doing that from the from the residences. Um, that was the essence of the of that concept. Um, the input that we received. Um, in, uh, at, the, at the conclusion of that meeting, there was a motion made and the uh, commission voted for the passive concept um, by, by a margin of three to two. Um, again, the sentiment in, expressed in the meeting by the attendees was largely in favor of the passive. So now here we are today and um, I'm here to answer any questions you have, uh, help move this process forward. What I've got as a point of reference is basically uh, each of the ideas that we've explored uh, to look at as kind of a, a side by side. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my presentation. Okay, thank you. Questions from the dais? Mr. Albert? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think actually my questions are all for staff. But, uh, but that's, that's fine. Uh, it's okay if I ask them now, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, uh, one thing that I was curious about, um, Amy, the uh, emails that we've, been, we've all been getting, uh, there's been reference to, I think the term is of a, of a wildlife corridor, basically that the North Crestview Park needs to be preserved as it is or as close to as it is as it can be because it's part of a wildlife corridor. And I have to admit I had never... Uh, heard staff in any of the presentations we've had over the years about that area uh, ever talk about that. So I was wondering if we have any um, uh, objective information about whether that, in fact, actually is a wildlife corridor. Um, Yeah, generally just what we've been told, so. Okay, so uh, it, it's never been studied as, as part of uh, as some EIR process or? No, it hasn't. Okay. Um, the other question I had, the, the second question I had was, um, uh, I think I had mentioned this one to Tara uh, earlier today, was I'd like to get a sense of how much money was spent on preparing the master plan, both in terms of uh, 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 external costs for the consultant and also internal costs, staff time and, and dollar version of that. Sure. Um, to date, we've spent approximately $41,400 on the contract with Calendar Associates. Right. Um, we have spent approximately just under $8,000 on community outreach and marketing. And our internal staff time that we estimated um, over the course of this project is about 80 staff hours, which includes a time split between the Public Works Director and Parks and Recreation Director. Okay. And what would that amount to in dollars, do you think? 
I don't have that figure off the top of my head. All right, I'll I'll make a number up based on uh, what I my understanding is of compensation and stuff. That's okay. That's fine. It's basically two weeks worth of a, a staff person's time, senior staff person. Correct. Time. Yes. Um, uh, last question at this point is. Um, I wanted to get some sense of, since the topic of a passive use park is, is sort of prominent in this, in this whole discussion, um, what's been the history of residents in San Carlos asking for, either asking for specifically a passive use park or the expansion of, for example, like Big Canyon or Eaton or whatever, which I tend to think of as our two passive use parks. Mm -hmm. Mostly, I mean, any park can be used for passive uses, but those are two that pretty much are only able to be used for passive uses. Um, the one most recent conversation that comes to mind is Chilton Park, um, which our former Parks and Recreation Director Christine Boland had a meeting with some of the residents and neighbors um, surrounding that park, with them just kind of requesting updates to the landscape and not much to be changed. So that's um, just one that I know of, know of in more recent years. But it sounds like it's it's not like you're being, uh, I don't want to say inundated, but it's not like you're getting lots of requests saying, hey, we need to have more hiking trails, we need to have more of this, we need to have more of that. Um, no. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Collins? Mr. Collins? <coughs> Brief question. Oh. I must have accidentally turned it off again. So anyway, sorry about that. Um, I took a walk up there yesterday just to check it out. I hadn't been up there in about five years. Um, and there's a fence along the back. And there are parts of it that are, you know, they looks like they've been either bent or, you know, there's openings in them and that sort of thing. Who's responsible for the main t maintenance of that fence? Is that us or is it the water, San Francisco Water Department? That is the uh, SFPUC, so that's their property back there. And we have mentioned to them on a number of occasions that there's locations in the fence where it gets either cut or bent so that people are going kind of right. back and forth across into the open space area out there. So if, if whatever we adopt, would uh, new fencing be something that we would do? Uh, would we do a fence in front of it, or would we just continue to demand that they, they fix their fence? Um, well, I guess that's, I'd consider that a design detail. So I, what my first, um, my first preference would be that we would ask the SFPUC to take care of their fence and make sure that they're keeping it up. If we had any increase in activity up there, then we certainly don't want to have that be seen as kind of accessible back and forth through that watershed area. So conceivably, would we put our own fence in front of it? We could, but again, my sense is it's really um, something I would rather have the SFPUC do, keeping up their own fence, because that is their fence out there now. Rather not have two fences, then. That's right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Mr. Grocott? Uh, just real quick. The, uh, so in e each one of these... Um, the dollar figures mm -hmm. that's estimated for construction? Yeah, those are all construction cost estimates that are more included in your packet. Okay. Yeah. It, it, but can you go with, just, just so we're clear, based on the different quadrants on that graphic, can you apply those Go numbers? through the cost estimates? Yes. Sure. Thank you. The top left cost estimate is between $350,000 and $450,000. The bottom left, so the mixed use concept plan one, is estimated at between 1.5 million and 1.9 million. The mixed use concept two, which is your bottom right hand, is estimated between 1.6 and 2 million dollars. And your top right, which is considered the active use plan, is estimated between 1.8 million and 2.3 million dollars. Those are all construction costs. Yeah, can so, we do a follow-up question on that thing? Sure. For, um, once they were built, whichever uh, one we would go with, uh, the operational costs estimated for, say, the first year, first five years or something, do we have any idea? We, yeah, we didn't. Calculated. Do you care to comment on it? I guess for comparison purposes, um, the most active use concept would probably be comparable to the Crestview Park maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then the passive use concept, I think, obviously with um, items that are constructed there, that would be more than what we're spending on that park and on Chilton Park now, which are um, very, very minor expenditures, if any. So, again, I don't have a, I don't have a ballpark figure for you okay. on that. All right. Thank you. Other questions, Mr. Crocott? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Johnson, anything? I'm okay. Okay. All right. Um, there'll be an opportunity, obviously, to ask questions if we need to. Um, I have a number of speaker cards. Uh, we'd like to limit the, the comments to about two minutes, if we could. Uh, I'm just going to call these the way I was handed them. Uh, if we could, I'll call a couple of names so the second person hopefully can be ready to go. Um, first name I have is John Lilligren, Lilligren followed by Mary Lou Lathrop. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, I'm here to support the passive use option because I believe it's the most environmentally friendly and fiscally responsible use for North Crestview Park. I urge you to vote for the passive option. And as a comment, um, over the past several months, the discussion has really been uh, very conceptual for the design. So I'm hoping you pick the passive use park uh, option and that we will have a opportunity to do more detailed input on specifically what would go in that location. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mary Lou Lathrop followed by Jill Kulik. I'm in favor of the passive use plan because it's uh, the least costly and also because it's environmentally uh, favorable. Thank you. Thank you. I urge you to vote for that. All right. Well, at this pace, we might be done by 8 o'clock. That's amazing. <laughs> count, me, count me in as passive. Jill Kulik, I live on Crestview. And it feels to me that the neighborhood really would like to keep it as a natural environment, not only for us, but for the wildlife. I don't know how you prove it's a wildlife corridor or not, but we hope that you'll help us protect them. Thank you for your comments. Um, Chris Lantman, followed by Paul Payton. Welcome. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. My name is Dr. Chris Lampman. Uh, my family and I have lived in San Carlos nearly 15 years. And I'd like to thank you for your service to the city and also for the engagement with residents that has really happened regarding the plans for North Crestview Park. The community meetings have been very, very helpful to gather voices and to hear the opinions of our neighbors. I attended several of these sessions, uh, including the November meeting that was referenced briefly of the Parks, Recs, and Culture Commission, and the discussion clearly showed a strong public preference to leave Northview, North Crestview Park untouched or at least minimally developed. The meetings also clearly voiced a need for additional sports facilities for the children of San Carlos, which would be better served by other locations. We live about a mile down the hill from the park, and I walked the North Crestview site personally. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you did too. Um, but let me be your eyes and ears if you haven't been up there. And just let me say that active or mixed use alternatives are not acceptable compromises. The city can't really afford them at this point, and they fail to meet the needs of our families. So I urge you to follow the recommendations of the Parks and Rec Commission and pass tonight's resolution authorizing the passive use concept for the master plan and thank you again for your service and for hearing the voice of our community thank you for your comments uh, paul payton followed by marilyn brewer so i reside at uh, three azalea lanes uh, one of the uh, earlier photographs was a nice picture of my uh, my house so um, uh, I would again like to argue for passive use at most. I, the upper left quadrant uh, options probably uh, maybe even slight overkill. I'd like to see it modified so that people who have difficulty walking um, can have an easier time on some of the pathways. I really don't want to see uh, nature disrupted, and I'd like to see as little work done as possible uh, toward disrupting nature. It's sort of the engineer's maxim of do as little as possible to get something uh, operational and functional. And lastly, I'd like to remind everyone that, um, this is kind of a strange way of putting it, but there is an orange man living in a White House right now, and I think 
what we would best be doing is keeping our money close to our vests in case of uh, financial upheaval. So, so expenditures of a large scale probably are ill-advised at this point. We want to keep our powder dry. Uh, also, I'd like to not give a nod to Matt Grocott. He caught a very, very interesting and important point, which is the operations and maintenance costs. That always gets you. The construction costs are um, usually ballparked, but the O&M costs do tend to get you over the time. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments. Uh, we have Marilyn Brewer followed by Peter Maison-Pierre. My name is Marilyn Brewer, and I'm a resident of San Carlos, but I'm speaking tonight on behalf of CR Club. CR Club strongly advocates to have open space within our, our boundaries so that people can get away from it all, get up above the, um, the noise and the traffic. And Chris, you drive provide several opportunities to do that. Most of us know about the highest point of, of that street, it has the best view of all. You can see our city and the bay and Mount Diablo. But, and then you can also go down to um, Vista Park, which is a little, a little pocket park that's a little bit of open space that you can see that view, but you can also get out of your car and, and um, sit for a while or have a have some lunch. And then across the street, of course, is North Crestview Park, which is pretty steep in general. But when you go all the way up to the top to that fence, uh, it's, it's really neat. You can look, stand there at that fence and you can look both ways. You can't do that anywhere else. You can look over to the west and see the Santa Cruz Mountains, and you can turn around and look to the east and see the bay and Mount Diablo and all kinds of things. So I think it's, it's pretty nice. If we have the Passive Park, which we support, then we can also have a place to sit for a while. If, if you put in some, a few benches and you can look down and you won't see a parking lot in front of your face and you won't see um, a, to a toilet and, and maybe not too much noise. It's really important to be able to go someplace and just get some peace and quiet. And that's what open space is about. And we think this is a nice special place to have open space and we hope that you will vote for the passive plan. All right, thank you for your comments. You. Peter Maison Pierre, followed by Liz Seckler. How'd I do in that name? Good, bad? I'm sorry? How'd I do in the name? Did I do very, it? Very nice. Okay, let me just check. Um, I'm Peter Maison Pierre. I'm a uh, homeowner up in the Crestview. Uh, by the way, Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and council members. Um, I want to add my voice to uh, passive, actually minimal, um, changes to the park. One point I'd like to make about active use is in proposing playing fields, I've been up to the park many times, and it's very exposed, which I love. I mean, it's beautiful in, in all kinds of weather. Watching the weather come over the western hills, it's superb. But it's extremely exposed, and um, I'm concerned that if you start building playing fields up there, there's probably going to have to be some kind of remediation with regard to wind, such as if you look at exposed tennis courts, inevitably they end up putting you know, green uh, wind blankets up around the tennis court. I, I could imagine that maybe something like that is, you know, people would complain about just how exposed and windy it can be up there. So. Anyway, to repeat, I, I'm strongly in favor of passive to minimal. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Liz Seckler, followed by Alice Kaufman. Good evening, gentlemen. <clears throat> I also am in favor of minimal development, if not passive. Um, I'm a nearby neighbor, and to speak to Councilman Albert's point, I think the reason a lot of people haven't actively requested the city grant more open space is because we've been enjoying it up there. Those of us who've lived in San Carlos for years, those of us who live near the area, take the opportunity to go up there and explore and live and see the wild animals. Um, as far as it being a wildlife corridor, I know some spe people will speak to that, but I personally personally look outside and see deer yesterday morning, three of them within 10 feet of my back fence. Today I saw a hawk literally come down and swoop up and pick up a snake. My concern 
uh, is if even a mixed use is put up there, the first time some child runs over to get an errant ball and is going over into the grassy area and finds a snake who, being cold-blooded, is going to sun himself on the tarmac or in the grasses because they sun themselves to keep warm, the kid's going to go screaming and the parents are going to say it's not safe to have active use mixed with a passive up at North Crestview Park. So I urge you to follow the park and rec and the community input and vote for the passive, if not minimally passive. And I also welcome the opportunity to refine the current plan as it's voted upon. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, Alice Kaufman followed by Bob Daner. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Alice Kaufman. I'm with Committee for Green Foothills. We're a nonprofit organization working to protect open space and natural resources in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Um, I'm here also to urge you for the, to, to choose the passive uh, use plan. And I would like to speak to the issue of the wildlife corridor. Um, this piece of land does form a wildlife corridor link between two large expanses of open space. You have the hilly wooded area between Crestview Drive and the Devonshire neighborhood. And this uh, park, together with Vista Park across the street, forms the link between that and the San Francisco watershed lands that extend from Woodside all the way up the peninsula, um, encompassing the Crystal Springs reservoirs and thousands of acres of protected open space. And Crestview Drive forms a barrier of houses between these two wildlife habitat areas. So this is really the only place where wildlife can get through. Just looking at this um, site on Google Earth, I can tell that that is where wildlife would go through. They have no other place to go through. But it doesn't rest just on that. You've, um, there's been some testimony tonight, and there was much more testimony in front of the Parks Commission meeting from residents who are very familiar with the area, who have stated the great variety of wildlife that they've seen there, much more, uh, much more diverse and much more free frequent occurrences than you typically see in, in, a, in a residential neighborhood. And this is why the wildlife are really being forced through there because there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, another thing that I'd like to um, comment on to pick up on the, on the last comment is that this is not an unused site. Uh, the local residents in the, are, are currently using it as, in, as a passive use park with, um, to go up and enjoy nature and the views. So to uh, change it from its current use to a more active use is something that I think that the city should be should uh, not do lightly and should take into account the, the needs of the existing users. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Bob Dare followed by Michael James. I apologize for the Hurry up, Bob. Come on. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, don't get old. <laughs> I'm already old, Bob. Trust me. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the time. Thank you. I do not live in North Crestview Park, but I am a neighbor, just like neighbor. I am a neighbor of all of our parks in San Carlos. My interest in the parks is that our parks serve everyone in our community in the best way possible. So tonight, I'm speaking in support of a city staff recommendation for a passive use for this park. It's the right use for this site. The city has over the past year given an opportunity in many public meetings for everyone's voice to be heard. In all of these public meetings, there's been overwhelming support for the original calendar design for a more passive use of this park. I urge you tonight to join with and to support your neighbors here and approve the staff recommendations. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Uh, Michael James, followed by Sarah Timby. Good evening. Uh, I'm also here in support of the passive use of this park. Uh, I, I live about a mile from the, the site, and while I, I'm not affected directly by the amount of traffic that goes there, uh, I, I think is, is best use as a serene point for observation of nature. Um, it's also near the highest point of the entire city, and uh, on a clear night, it's a nice place to look at the stars. So I'd also like to voice a preference for not having uh, light pollution in the areas might be stadium lights or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Sarah Timby, followed by Mary Fowl. Sarah Timby, I, I want to also add my voice to the passive use. It's, um, the site is very important in terms of its view and its um, current um, 
um, slope and so on, it, it, to make it into something else would, would be wasting what we have there already, I think. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mary Farrell, followed by Vesna Abradovic. Well, I don't mean to sound redundant, <laughs> <laughs> but I do uh, follow what almost everybody here is saying. And I've been walking up there since 1991 when I moved about a mile down from Crestview on Club Drive. And every time I walk there, I look at the view and I see wild foxes, I see uh, white-tailed rabbits, I see... Uh, uh, you know, I, I see many, many different kinds of birds. I've seen snakes, which I don't like, but I do love the nature, and I just cannot say how much joy it's brought in my life. And I know it will bring much joy in everyone else's. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Vesna Abadovic, followed by Bob Black. Good evening. Uh Thank you for letting me speak. I suppose the passive use uh, concept for the open space park with trails for all. Um, number one, uh, considering the nature that we have up there and the topography of this piece of land, it seems to me that passive use would be the best choice so that um, people of all ages can use it. And number two, even for the passive use, the cost may, may go beyond anticipated. Uh, but any other project there would have used enormous funds. Um, we could use the money to improve what we already have in our other parks and fields and get much better bang for our buck. Um, I've been in San Carlos, I've been living in San Carlos for 20 years and I'm about a mile away from the park and I really enjoy going up there. So I hope the rest of you will too. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Bob Black, followed, followed by David Krabby. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I propose also, I support the passive use of Crestview Park, North Crestview Park. <clears throat> and uh, of course, I'm preoccupied with astronomy and stargazing, and it would be an excellent spot for doing stargazing uh, with uh, a simple modification of, of uh, uh, painting uh, the uh, defining the park uh, the walkway up to the uh, uh, memorial uh, with white stripes so it could be seen by people at night who wouldn't need flashlights uh, and it would be uh, assisted if there were a little bit of a paved area uh, so that groups could gather up there. And I would like, I'd hope that it could be uh, available all night, not closed at 10 o'clock, upon request, and that would be controlled by Parks and Rec. So uh, I hope you will support the astronomy up at North Crestview Park. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right, uh, David Krabby, followed by uh, Deb Kramer. Hi, David. Hi. Uh, yeah, I, I support the majority of the people tonight in terms of the passive con concern. The one thing I want to bring up that we uh, I'd like to see, and we it was mentioned at the very beginning of the, the first meeting we had, is the possibility of a memorial for the uh, war dogs up on the top of the hill, and that wasn't mentioned in the presentation. And uh, as it as, as this proceeds, assuming that it does get the passive approach, I'd like to make sure that the uh, landscape designer takes that into consideration. Also, the uh, the views are really interesting. I've walked up there too, and even across the front of that, as you go up the big berm to the top, if you go from the north end and the view from there, and you go to the middle and the view from the south end, it changes entirely in terms of what you see. And it's it's a, it's it, yeah, I, so the, the outlook should be kind of spread about a little bit on the thing. So, yay for the passive. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Deb Kramer, followed by Bonnie McClure. 
Thanks for allowing me to speak. My name is Deb Kramer, and I live in San Carlos. I've lived here over 20 years in the Devonshire Canyon area, and I can attest to the value of the open space at the top because we have lots of animals at the bottom of the canyon, and the only way they can get there is by going through the open space. Uh, I also support the passive use and especially lower passive use if possible so that we can um, have as much open space for the animals and people to enjoy. Um, a lower paving and um, maybe not even development of trails, but it just seems like it's a nice space. I visited Vista Park. I do enjoy the views there as well. So again, just as little development as possible. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Bonnie McClure. Nice hat, Bonnie. That's nice. Where'd you get that? Uh, like the hat. I like the hat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll have to bring another one next time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Brian McClure. I've lived here almost 60 years. Uh, I like that site up there. It's beautiful. But the uh, thing I'd like to point out is that the trails in the passive use are designed for people that are in wheelchairs. Now, I'm only using a walking stick now, but I know someday I'm going to need a wheelchair. And I know there are people in the audience that cannot walk the trails at the canyon or Eaton because they're not suitable. And so I urge you to uh, stay with the passive. And I do like the dog memorial. And I, I think it gives a destination for people to get to. So please consider that. Thank you very much. OK, is there anyone else wishing to speak tonight on this item? Yes, please come ahead, and just you can fill out a form later and just answer the city clerk. Welcome. Hi, my name is Eloise Carlton, and I've been a resident here for about 20, 20 years or more, 25 years. And uh, this park is my daily destination. Come rain or shine, I walk up there about a mile and a half from Melody Drive. And recently, it's really been wild up there when it's raining and the wind is blowing and it would be completely it's completely unsuitable site for a soccer field it seems to me it's just a beautiful place to go a, desti a destination as the previous speaker said and so i hope you'll vote for the passive or minimal use thank you thank you for your comments is there anyone else wishing to speak tonight on this item all right thank you um i have a quick question for staff amy or perhaps for process, I guess. Uh, we'll give, we'll have some sort of a vote tonight probably to probably pick one of these four or whatever. Then what's the next step after that? Because we're not going to go into the details tonight of this. Right. So um, pending a, a concept gets passed tonight, mm -hmm. we will move forward with an RFP for design consultants to then go through the design process. Mm -hmm. um, we do have money still left in the budget to get the design process started. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of the plan from here. And then it, it would go to the Planning Commission. After that's done, it would go to Planning Commission and then come to us? It would go to the Parks, Recreation, and Culture sorry, Commission. Park and Rec I yes. pardon. Mm -hmm. Park and Rec Commission, sorry. Yes. And then it would come to us. And then it would come back. So just, I'm just letting everybody in the audience know what the next steps are. We're not going to pick all the details out tonight. It's going to be another, another sure. yep. few meetings. Uh, okay. Yep, a whole slew of community input meetings um, for the That's design. That's I wanted to make sure mm -hmm. that we understood there's a lot more community input coming. Yes. No matter which one we pick. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen, what is your uh, preference here? Don't all talk at once. Well, Mr. Mayor, um, you want to for a motion? <clears throat> Whatever you'd like to do, Mr. Collins. All right. Um, well, I will, uh, let's see, this is 7B. I'll move a, to adopt resolution 2017-13. 13. 13, a resolution by the City Council of the City of San Carlos approving a master plan for North Crestview Park, and there's no language in here. So what I just say with a preference for passive use. All right. Is there a second to that motion? No well, second. All right, it's moved and seconded. Discussion. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Olbert. A um, couple of points to make, but I'd also like to start by having Crystal put up a, a little chart that I put together. It's just a single page, Crystal, so you can, I, I decided it was too complicated using the, the pointers. So, um, hmm. That's interesting. Do we need to pick our color theme? <laughs> there we go. I was going to say, they didn't look like any colors I had picked. Um, 
This is a little chart that I put together because I, I was intrigued by something that had popped up in quite a few of the emails that we got from folks about preferring the passive use here. Um, and basically what I did is I went to Wikipedia and I looked at all of the, um, I think of them as the Bayshore communities, the communities along the bay side of San Mateo County, um, and looked at the average square feet of land, not water, because obviously you can't live in water, of uh, square feet of land per person based on their population. And what's interesting to me is if you look at the very bottom of the chart, uh, Colma, of course, is kind of an odd situation because uh, um, it's a great little community. I always love going there, but you know, they always and talk about And we all will. Yes, yeah. we all will. <laughs> Maybe you should put a per living person. <laughs> yes. Um, and I apologize to my friends in Atherton. I left the T out of their name. I'm not sure how that happened. I guess spell checking doesn't work well for me. Um, but basically, what, if you look at this, what you see is that San Carlos, in terms of the square feet of land per person, actually is the third highest or least densely populated uh, of these communities um, on the Bayshore side of, of San Mateo County. Um, and I say that just because I want people to understand this explains something I've always seen on maps of San Carlos. There's a lot of open space in San Carlos. In fact, if you look at the numbers, there's one person for every 5,000 square feet. And since the average lot in San Carlos is about 5,000 square feet, that means we could actually take our entire population, put one person on each lot, you know, lot size thing, and just barely fill up the town. So I just want folks to keep that in mind as we go forward with this and other discussions about um, uh, land use and open space, that San Carlos actually has quite a bit of open space. Um, now, as far as this particular item is concerned, uh, I, I also want to sort of apologize for something that I missed last year when this first, first came up. Um, I actually believe that this entire process that we went through was a mistake, and it was not a good use of money. And the reason for that is, as far as I can tell from talking to Jeff Malpe, um, there was no community outcry or demand to say, please come up with a master plan for North Crestview Park. Um, as we heard many, many times from people tonight and, and heard many times during each of the, uh, the hearings, the public hearings that, that have been held on this topic, um, basically the vast majority of people said, just leave things alone. Just don't change anything. Given that, it sort of raises the question, well, why did we spend 60,000 bucks seeing if there was something else we wanted to do? I'll mention in passing, my colleagues know I'm a broken record about this, 60,000 bucks would pay for a year's worth of sidewalk repairs, for, or splitting the cost of sidewalk repairs, which I suspect would be more important to people in the community than $60,000 spent on this uh, master plan. So um, at the end of the day, because there wasn't really a request for this, and I'm not sure why staff even brought it to us, and I didn't ask that question of why are you bringing it to us last year. We've spent the 60,000 bucks. Um, I'm going to be voting against this proposal, but solely because I don't think we should have done it in the first place. Let's just leave it alone. Okay? That, that land was up there for 40 years um, with nothing going on, and everything was just fine. I can tell you that most of the council didn't even know that it was public property. Uh, years ago when, when, uh, when, when this came up uh, for the first time. So I'm going to be voting no on this. I actually wish we hadn't have spent the 60000 bucks, but you know I don't own a time machine, so can't do anything about that. Just have to remember going forward to ask better questions next time. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins, any comments? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming, and thank you for your emails and uh, um, your correspondence uh, and coming to all the community meetings that we had. Uh, this is the first uh, issue, I guess, that I've been involved in since I've been on the council for five years now, that someone actually sent me an email and said, stop having meetings. You're doing too much outreach, which was the first time I'd ever seen that. So, um, But anyway, it was a process, uh, regardless of whether or not we spent too much money on we went through the process. You know, it, it's a park that really a lot of people didn't know what was there until a couple of years ago, and now they do. So we went through this process. Um, but I do, I do appreciate all the input that we've gotten, um, and it's important to get that input. I believe when you start down this road, you do need to find out what the people of this town want. Um, Based on a lot of those emails, too, a lot of my thinking was, yeah, why, do, why are we doing anything? Why don't we just leave it alone? And then I, a couple comments that people made got me to thinking about people with handicap access. Um, as they get older, they're going to want uh, the access um, to be a little bit easier for them. That's one of the reasons that I went back up there uh, uh, yesterday. I was there, my wife and I took a, a hike up there about five years ago. 
and because it was a topic of discussion on of what to do with it um, on the council at that time. But yesterday I wanted to refamiliarize myself, so I spent about 40 minutes up there, and I realized that, I mean, it's everybody agrees it's lovely land and that sort of thing. Very uneven terrain, very wet up there, obviously, because of the recent storms. Um, but it, it, if you're not, um, you know, agile, like, most of the people in this room, and myself included, um, it can be difficult. You know, I slipped a couple times. I mean, there's a, there's a concrete culvert, and there's sort of an undefined road, and I'd love to just leave it alone and not do anything with it. Um, but I think it's kind of unfair to those people who really want to enjoy it, not that I want to see it overdeveloped. Um, and I, uh, I do tend toward doing the minimal amount to it. Um, I don't even like spending three or four hundred thousand, but if we can find a way to make it more accessible to people with disabilities, I think that would be important. Um, and Liz, I actually saw those deer myself yesterday, um, just south of there. Uh, three of them, yeah. Yeah, fairly good size, yeah. Um, but, you know, doing something like this, or uh, basically not doing uh, some of the other alternatives with this land, means that, you know, there's always an impact. You know, the old... Uh, What's that scientific uh, expression about every action has a reaction? Well, sometimes having doing no action also has a reaction in that we have members of this community who uh, admittedly didn't come out in force to say that they wanted an athletic field or soccer field or basketball courts or whatever. They just, I got a couple of emails. I'm sure we all got a, one or two. But even though they didn't, doesn't mean that that problem doesn't still exist. And we have other fields in town that are impacted. Um, there is a great demand on our fields. Um, and this, is, this problem goes back 60 years since my family moved here. There's always been a dearth of, of, uh, of athletic facilities and fields for kids to, to use. And there's even more now. There's more people. There, there's more kids. So I, I hope people are mindful of the fact that by doing very little to this park, that that need for uh, to maximize the use of our other fields is still there, and we as a council are going to have to be looking at that uh, down the road. There are other fields that we're going to try to be looking to maximize the use of, and there will be an impact on the neighbors there as well. So, it you know, doing nothing doesn't always uh, mean that. Uh, nobody's impact. You know, th th there is going to be sort of a consequence of this. So that's, that's pretty much, I, I kind of went through my list of things I wanted to say, but again, thank you all for coming out. Okay, uh, Mr. Olbert, uh, pardon me, I don't, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks to everybody for coming out as well and for participating and, and reaching out and all the emails. Um, I, I do actually think that this vote is, is very important. It's important to know what we're doing, which is we're, we're passing a plan. Um, we're not actually appropriating money, we're not building anything, and as everybody I know in the audience is well aware, there's been a lot of question about what's the plan for North Crestview Park in the city for the last several years. And we talked about putting a school up there. there at that time, there was talking about, well, should we sell it to a developer and you know build housing up there? There was, you know, and now with this process, there's been talk. Well, should you know you put a sports field up there? Should you put basketball courts up there? So, that, so what we what we do with this vote is we say no. You know, there is a master plan, and that plan results in a passive use for the park, and it puts that issue to bed for everybody. Um, Ron mentioned, you know, soccer fields. My daughter played soccer for the first year this time, or for the first time this year. My son is coming up right behind her, and um, we do need more soccer fields in this town. Um, we are uh, there are teams that have to go to other communities to play, but um, and every once in a while you do want to. Um, do something that the entire, even when you have unanimity of all the neighbors in the community, you want to do it anyway and have them all hate you for it. But, um, but I think this is one of those cases where this is not where you'd want to put a soccer field just from the, the topography and the environmental concerns and the cost and the fact that it's on the edge of town and et cetera. So um, I, I think that the, you know, I think sports uses are important for our community, and it's something that I will continue to work on, we will all continue to work on. But as everyone has mentioned, it's a beautiful <laughs> spot up there. Uh, and I know that the neighbors get a lot of um, joy out of the place. Putting in some trails and some benches, 
place to look at the stars. Um, I think is it would make it would make it nicer. Would give more access to more bigger swath of the community. And you know what I'd say to Mark is that I hope you will support this, and that you know when it comes time to appropriate the money to build it, we can say, well, we don't want to do it next year, or that we don't want to do it this year, and we will do it next year, or next year, or next year. But at least we have a plan in place that says, you know, going forward, this is this is what the this is what the community wants to do with this land for the long term. So I will be supporting it. Okay, Mr. Groka, any comments? Yeah, just a, just a few. Um, I was looking for a word to use uh, regarding what we're doing. Cameron wrapped it up pretty well, but I think what we're doing here is we're memorial, memorializing this as a park. Somebody had said earlier, a couple of people have said that we didn't even know we had a park there. Well. I looked up the definition of the word memorialize. I was wondering why that came to mind. And it's when you memorialize something, you honor it or do something so it will be remembered. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're taking a little bit of action for a passive park so that it will be remembered as a park, that it is a park. We won't try to sell it to the school district to build a school. We won't sell it to a developer to build houses. We're actually saying, no, this is a park. There'll be a sign there, at least, if nothing else, that says this is one of San Carlos's parks. And that's important to do. So, um, and, and then the, just the other comment I have is I, uh, of all the speakers, not to, you know, uh, have this come out wrong, but I think uh, tonight, of all the speakers, the one, the, let, let me put it this way, the one that spoke to me the most was Bob. Because Bob said, uh, Bob Daner, he said, it's the right use for this site, and I agree. It is the perfect use for this site. Okay, Mr. Olbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I wasn't planning on saying anything else, but since Cameron specifically uh, asked for uh, a response, um, I am still going to oppose this, Cameron, and I'm still going to oppose any attempt to authorize money to spend here because, frankly, um, the amount of money, even on the minimal level that we're talking about spending, could be far better spent meeting other community needs. Um, uh, that I think everybody in the community would really appreciate. We have parks with accessibility, one right across the street, Ron, uh, Vista Park. I see quite a few people there on occasion. And, um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we do have to be conscious of budgetary issues. We're not voting on that tonight, but um, putting a stake in the ground saying that we need to spend money here or plan on spending money here when, by my head count, um, most of the people who spoke here said, please don't do anything at all. Um, I think that's what we ought to do to honor the desires of the community. Okay. Um, I'll be voting for this item. I think it's uh, the best use. It's been repeated up here and repeated by the folks that spoke. Um, I think it's the best use. And again, as I mentioned, this is just the beginning of the process. Uh, staff will be uh, doing a lot more work. We'll have a lot more community input to see how much, if any, development we want to put up there. But uh, I'll be voting for the passive use. So any other comments from this? If not, uh, we have the question, so it's been moved and seconded, so roll call, please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? No. Mayor Grisilli? Yes. All right, and again, thank you all for coming tonight and your input. And those of you who would like to leave, you can do so now, or you can stay. We'll take about a minute so everybody can clear if they need to go. Again, thank you all for participating. I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity to go to the bathroom. Okay, go ahead. You guys want to need to go out? Go ahead. Okay. I think it's the first time I've ever had 90 percent of people never. Really? Yeah. yeah. Kind of goes with that's in line with passive use. Don't say much. <laughs>
move on to the next item. Mr. Collins. Just one second now. I just want to make sure Ron wasn't out there. I don't think he is. We'll be moving on to item 6A, which is a discussion of tree regulations in just a moment. And we'll get started. So, Mr. Save. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. The Council requested that staff provide a report on the City's heritage tree regulations. Principal Planner Lisa Costa Sanders will provide you with a presentation and will be available to answer questions. Lisa. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Good evening. So the San Carlos Municipal Code defines uh, several different trees as being under the protected status, and that includes heritage trees. This is going to be based on size and based on species. So buckeye, madrone, oak, laurel, redwood would be considered heritage trees if they meet the size criteria that's outlined in the code. Significant trees, any of the trees that are not listed above when at least when measured at least 36 inches in circumference. And then founder trees, we discussed this at a previous meeting. It's any tree known to have been planted prior to the city's incorporation, and that includes some of the eucalyptus trees that are located along San Carlos Avenue. Exempt trees, regardless of their size, includes acacia, Monterey pine, and eucalyptus trees, except if it's a founder tree or when it's uh, eucalyptus is in a group of trees. So trees and landscaping within the public right-of-way. The city is responsible for public landscaping when it's located within a landscape median, uh, within a city park or city-owned property, as well as trees along uh, the downtown core. Private property owners then are responsible for any landscaping, any trees located adjacent to their properties when located in the public right-of-way. And the code does have some maintenance requirements outlined, including um, maintaining some clearance above sidewalks as well as above roadways. So as I indicated, property owners are required to main tree, maintain trees and landscaping adjacent to their properties. If it is determined that the tree um, is damaging sidewalk or impeding the right-of-way, a city inspector will go out and take a look at the tree as well as the city's arborist, and they'll develop a plan and work with the property owner to modify the sidewalk or prune the tree. It could be that just removing some limbs or pruning the roots and repaving the, the sidewalk would resolve the issue. If a property owner wishes to remove a tree in the public right-of-way, uh, they would need to apply for a permit through the Community Development Department. The city also maintains a list of approved street trees for a new planting. And then the process for trees on private property. Um, if a property owner wishes to remove a tree, there's a, a requirement to obtain a permit from the Community Development Department. The property owner has the option of either submitting an arborist report that they contract and, and, we t and submit that into us for review, or the city arborist could inspect the tree on behalf of the property owner and would make a recommendation to staff. Staff can then grant a permit if it's able to make the findings that are outlined in the code. Um, and there are replacement requirements of one at least 24 inch box tree for each tree removed. Tree removals that are due to development projects are considered by the reviewing body, so that could be the RDRC or the Planning Commission. Um, and then on enforcement side, if the city receives a complaint on a tree, the city arborist would inspect the tree, and then staff would work with the property owner to implement the required actions. Could be trimming, could be some better maintenance, watering, or ultimately removal if the tree is deemed to be dead, diseased, or dangerous. And we'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Mr. Collins? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple of questions. What constitutes a group of trees? How do we define group? Um, I need to double check that definition, but I think it's four more trees in a, in a, in a grouping in an area. Okay. And it's, gen it's really just the eucalyptus. Okay. And then um, I noticed that the, the fee to, uh, of a permit to 
remove a tree on your property is three hundred sixty-five dollars. That's with the the city's arborist conducting the inspection. If they submit an arborist, the fee is reduced to two hundred seventy-four dollars. If they submit an arborist report, and does that cover non-heritage trees? It's only required for protected trees. If it's an exempt tree, they can just remove it by right. They can move it, remove it by right. Correct. Okay. Um, I was wondering if uh, what's the process to add a tree that we think ought to be on the exempt list? Uh, we would need to do a municipal code amendment. <coughs> okay. Um, I, I would like to see us consider adding camphor trees to that. I mean, you look at those trees in front of CVS. I mean, they've pulled up the sidewalk. I mean, everywhere there's a camphor tree in the media, in the you know, the park strip. There's a there's a raised sidewalk, so I think they're a public safety hazard. Okay. Personally, and I did ask um, the city arborist if there was any trees that he thought should be added to the list, and none immediately came to mind based on you know his review and inspections that he's been doing. But we can certainly look to add that. Yeah, um, we nice will be discussion with him. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, we will be um, amending the municipal code based on the previous council direction relating to the founder tree definition, so we can look at also adding additional exempt trees. Great. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Olbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Lisa. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, second what Ron said about, um, I'm not exactly sure what a camphor tree is, but one comment you made in that exchange there, I, I would strongly encourage staff to work with the arborist to go identify trees that are problematic because I know there are other species other than the ones that are on the list. I just don't know what they are. Sure. You, you just walk around the older neighborhoods and you can see all the sidewalks that have been reared up. Uh, there are plenty of people on the east side who will tell you about trees that they wish had never been planted you mm -hmm. know, there. So um, I'd love to see that list expanded to whatever it ought to include. Um, my first question is on, I think it was page two, it was the slide, Trees Within Public Right-of-Way Process. And this really may be a, a, a Greg question. Uh, the first bullet point said property owners are required to, main tree, required to main trees adjacent to their properties. I'd just like to understand what's the legal theory behind that. I understand what it is in the case of sidewalks. You and I have talked about that quite a bit. But what is it in the case of trees? Well, it, different cities have different uh, policy choices. Some cities have decided um, that the city, all the trees in the right of way would be maintained by the, the city. Um, it is a one of those situations from a policy standpoint where, uh, and there's some liability issues there too, that um, the, pro the private property owner is in the best position to um, identify problems as they come up um, and, and deal with the tree. Um, I think part of it is the sometimes unique way our streets are laid out in town is it's sometimes hard to tell what, when a tree is actually in the right of way or on private property. Some trees that are actually in the landscape area of somebody's house might be private property, I mean, excuse me, public property, it might be within the right of way, but there's a tree that um, maybe it's a, a heritage oak tree or a, or a tree that was planted later that is in that already landscape area of, of people's homes. So you can see there might be some conflicts between um, where the city right of way ends and where the public the private property owner's landscape begins. So the policy decision, make, make a long story short, I guess, or a short story long, um, is that um, we felt it was best um, uh, that the pro private property owner maintain the trees that are in front or adjacent to their property. Well, I appreciate you explaining that, because I have to admit I didn't think about the concept or the issue of trees that are clearly on private property but still affecting Mm -hmm. public right away. What, what I was actually thinking of uh, goes back to when I was first campaigning back in 2011. It's uh, trees in the planter strip, mm -hmm. okay, which is, as I understand it, that's clearly public property. It's actually part of the right of way because it's between the street and the sidewalk. That's right. Okay? And, and the question I have regarding that is, is, what's the basis for us saying that, yeah, it's a publicly planted tree, planted years ago, perhaps, but it's on a public right of way. It's causing damage to a public road or sidewalk, but we want you, the adjacent property owner, to pay for repairing it. I, I just don't understand that. And, and again, I understand with the sidewalk issue, you mm -hmm. told me the state granted us the, the ability to do stuff, but... I think it's related to, I think it's related to the maintenance of the sidewalk, and, um, and I touched on it, but the, the, the concept of, the, even in the median strip, the 
property owner who has the tree right in front of their house is in a, in a position where they can identify problems that arise um, with that tree in the right of in in front of their house, but in the right of way. Uh, uh, you know what I. I, I... I'll pass on this topic because it will be part of the policy discussion mm -hmm. later. It, that same logic could be used to say the people uh, on a piece of property would be best positioned to know when there's a pothole opening up in the street in front of them and, and we don't make them go out and repair the pothole. So, um, um, second question I had is um, some time ago, I think it was back in 2013, there were a group of residents from the White Oaks neighborhood who uh, came to the city council. They were quite upset. I don't remember the exact details, but I guess somebody was doing a, a remodel of a house or maybe a lot scrape and rebuilding, and, and it involved taking down a white oak tree. Um, and um, uh, that was approved by the review process. Um, the question I have is, is, do we have the right the statutory authority, I should say, to restrict those kind of actions for certain classes of trees on private property? And, and if so, um, how, how do we go about doing that? I'm not saying I necessarily want to, but I remember there was a lot of community outcry about that particular species and the particular tree because it had been around for a long time. Well, there, there is a, um, a, an argument to be made that the, the public um, has a, a right to regulate um, trees that are part of the history of the community and part of uh, the aesthetic of the community. Uh, you know, the White Oaks neighborhood, I think, is named White Oaks neighborhood for a reason. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, ancient oak trees that are there and have been there for a long time. Uh, and when, when one goes down, sometimes there's a lot of different reasons for it. One of them could be development, which I think is, is your question. The, our poli the city's police power um, extends into that area of aesthetics and preservation of community values and, and uh, even to historic trees. But that has to be balanced against the fact that a purely private tree on somebody's private property, is, it's actually their tree. Um, and so our, or the current ordinance we have tries to balance that by talking about um, preserving the tree, requiring to get a permit, the, the tree needs to be evaluated. If it's, if it's dangerous, it can be removed. Um, but from, a from our design review ordinance, the design review um, uh, process, either whether it's planning commission or RDRC, has discretion to review the aesthetics of a, of, of a particular application and can condition those, those approvals by, to preserve a tree. Uh, you know, you can come up with some extreme hypotheticals where the tree is in the, in the middle of the property and is preventing development. That creates a different set of issues. Uh, and those types of cases will take a lot of analysis to determine whether or not, uh, based on the particular facts of the case, whether or not there is an issue um, with a healthy tree that is preventing reasonable development of a site. We just have to evaluate those on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, the answer to your main question is that we do have the ability to regulate trees. We can retune our ordinance and move it on the, on the spectrum towards more protection, but we do have to take into account private property rights. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Grocott. So I have a question regarding the term heritage, if we know um, where that came from, because it seems to, me, what I'm asking is, what is the intended meaning of it? Because when, we, when I look at the list of trees, um, one could argue that some of these species are not, they're not necessarily native to San Carlos, even what some might think of as being native, like a, a redwood tree, for instance. There's, number one, there's different uh, species of redwood. There's the sequoia, there's the, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, and redwoods are actually native to the western side of Skyline, but they're not native to this side. And in fact, it's always sad to see um, like 
I know when I drive up to Santa Rosa, I always think it's so sad to see these redwood trees planted as landscaping along Highway 101 when you can tell the tree doesn't like the environment being that close to the roadway and it's, it's out of its natural environment and that the tree is designed for. Um, so um, the reason, that's the reason I asked, where, did we, where, where does the term heritage come from and what's the meaning of it and shouldn't we, if it's meant to be a heritage tree, is a tree native to San Carlos environs, even Buckeye, I mean I'm looking at trees on here and I'm thinking these are not native, so what is meant by heritage? Yeah, actually, um, I've done heritage tree research for other communities, and it's just a very commonly used word, I believe, that's recognized by other codes. And so I have a feeling it was a carryover from uh, an original ordinance that the, the city had. So I'm not sure it carries a special meaning here. I think it's more of a, a commonly used planning term to describe trees that want to be protected. Um, so that's something if you want us to take a look at a more comprehensive landscaping and tree update, we can certainly look at that and um, call out trees that are more native to this region um, as far as what needs to be protected and what can be removed by right, uh, some of the more invasive species as well. Well, let me, let me take it one step further then. Um, when we look at the, so, so there's a list under heritage trees of certain species of trees, um, but then there's also just this trees not specified above are considered significant if right. they measure, and, and so that's just saying... The catch-all. Yeah, sort of the catch-all <laughs> at 36 right. inches. Um, and, and in some cases you could have, uh, like for instance, I'm going to go back to Buckeye because I'm a little bit familiar, being that I am a Buckeye from Ohio, <laughs> um, a little bit familiar with that. With Buckeye trees you can get trees that are they're very ornamental mm -hmm. in nature and so trying to get it 36 inches would be a challenge um, because it's just a it tends to be a smaller structured tree the ornamental type buckeyes um, so what would be the impact if some of these trees were removed from the heritage list and just they fall under this significant trees umbrella we don't know yeah well not much distinction um, if you if you continue to have the significant tree at the 36 inches, then the buckeye right now is defined as 30 inches uh -huh. as being protected. So then if, if your example is the buckeye maybe just doesn't reach that, yeah. that size of maturity, then that might fall off some of the protected status. Um, same with the oak. The blue oak is at 24 inches. Um, you know, the, each tree seems to have a different size. The redwood, 72 inches, fast-growing, large oh. trunks. Yeah, uh, and, and Lisa, I would... Are, the, the oaks, I think all these oaks are native to, you know, when the Olowan Indians mm -hmm. lived around here, you probably found all those right. oak trees. Um, and I suppose the madrone, but the rest of these, uh, like I said, the, the redwood, I don't see it as applying. So if we're just trying to give direction, I think staff should look at that. And while we're giving direction and looking at things, also the, the issue with a redwood tree is um, redwood trees are not supposed to live in isolation to just one tree. They live, if you go look at their natural um, environment and how they grow, they grow in groves. Right. Um, and so adjusting that to look at a heritage grove versus, you know, if it's just a tree that's all by itself, mm -hmm. it's not, I don't see it myself falling on the heritage list. Only if it were in a grove or a group, the way it's meant to grow, then that's that's a different thing. And then you'd have to, it wouldn't necessarily be, uh, well, I guess if you were looking at that grove, to me it would be significant, and this is just me, Personally, it would be significant if you had a grove and all the trees were at about, you know, uh, mm -hmm. 10 inches. That if, if they're all that, right. then that's significant. And it doesn't meet this 30 inch or any of these things that you have here, like right. 72 inch. So I think that needs to be flushed out a little bit and studied and looked at. Okay. Thank Mr. You. Johnson, anything? Okay. Okay. Um, I have one speaker card, uh, Sarah Timby.
that I can come right after the, the discussion because first I want to talk to your to your point about the redwoods, which I basically agree with, but there are redwoods that are native along the creeks, like the Palo Alto tree on San Francisco Creek, and there are at least three other groves on San Francisco Creek coming down. San Carlos, I don't think they're, I'm a long time a California Native Plant Society person, <laughs> so I know a lot of these things. The buckeye they're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, the buckeye is, um, is a native to San Carlos. It's not your buckeye, from, it's, Cal it's the California buckeye. If we use scientific names, it would be clearer what, what's being referred to. And the um, madrone, you, you agree with the laurel, is actually the California bay tree, which was native in this area. If you get in the wooded slopes, um, you're also going to find things like Douglas fir and so on. But the redwood tree is, is tricky because people may want it because of its, yeah, yeah. But probably it was not, it was not, um, except for people who wanted it for, because it was such a, an important tree. That's, okay. So the other thing, the, the main thing I wanted to say today was um, I'd like a stronger heritage tree um, ordinance. And I know this is probably just the beginning of your thinking about it, but um, because of what's happened in my neighborhood, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to read this because it's, it's easier um, for me. Um, I live in, on Knoll Drive, and we just recently lost a, a very old, probably 400-year-old, um, not on my property, but two houses away, live oak. And it was on the edge of the property, and the developer wanted wanted it out because he wanted to enlarge the flat part of his property and build a um, a retaining wall, and that would have hurt the oak. And so it had it did get okay to be taken out. And I think that's there's something wrong there. And and I think we were talking about it earlier. I think we do need more oversight on. On re it affects the neighborhood, it affects the, the view from the people behind it, it affects the wildlife around it, and um, it's just, it's important to keep those old trees, especially old oaks. Um, I got off track. So that was the specific that got me interested in this. And, um, and I, in looking into the, the process of that, I became unhappy with the fact that the city arborist and the arborist that was hired by the developer, um, this is a legal question too, I think they should have put a caveat in their reports and I think this should always be required. If they say it is a disease tree, um, they're protecting themselves because if it does fail later, then they might be they would be held responsible if they didn't say it was diseased. You see, you see the point. We've had our oak trees looked at by a very good um, arborist, and that arborist always puts in a, a disclaimer saying that you know if you damage the roots or if it gets too old or whatever, it's going to fail. So, so it's right now it's weighted toward the arborist report saying it should come out. I guess that's it. That's what I'm basically getting at. So I think that's one thing that has to be included. And then just in general, I think having the heritage tree idea not just be a punishment for the developer, but having actually a protection of the tree involved. If they're just paying, you know, they're just paying a fee to have the tree removed, they'll go ahead and do it. But if we're going to try and keep the trees, it has to be worded and handled a little differently than it is currently. I don't know if you all see what I'm getting at here. Um, I looked in, into the heritage tree in our, in our city code, and I thought it should be rewritten. And, and
and I think I sent to some of you, I, to the council. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, there should be a whole new chapter, very easy for developers, remodelers, everybody to see what's required. And so it would include things like purpose, protection requirements, removal procedures, violation appeal, all in one chapter. I'd like it right after, not sort of mixed here and there throughout the whole document, but all together. Um, and then, as I said, the main thing is the, the priority should be to preserve the heritage trees. And that's what, to me, heritage means. It's, it's not just a kind of tree. It's something that is, we are giving it um, significance by naming it heritage. And that we would do, as, as some of you mentioned already, we would do more to try and maintain that, 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 that type of tree. Um, and then if, if a removal permit is granted, and again, this is from experience now, um, there should be clear mitigation requirements and accountability for noncompliance. I think people are getting away with removing trees that, um, partly legally, because of our looseness in definition. But if, if the community really wants to keep a tree, I think we should be able to handle that. Thank you, Ms. Timby. You're welcome. Thank you. I let you go over a lot because you really know what you're talking about, and, and I have no clue, I think, on this. So uh, my comment would be on these trees, to be quite honest. I, maybe you even mentioned it. I don't know the difference between a buckeye, a madrone, a laurel. I do know an oak or a redwood. Uh, I'm not much for names. I'm more for uh, is it a tree we want to keep or isn't it a tree we want to keep? And so I think that's, that would be my input to this is that um, heritage, there's, there's heritage founder significant exempt. Uh, it's like Boolean algebra here. This is part of this, but this isn't part of that. So for my money, uh, I would like to make it a little clearer and also to uh, identify it's, each tree is going to be specific, whether it's a, a laurel, a, a drone, a, a tree of heaven or whatever. I mean, you know, depending on where it is and what it is. I think we need to tighten it up a little bit. I honestly do. But again, this is why we're having a study session. So, uh, other comments? Uh, Mr. Collins? Uh, yeah, just, oops. Sorry, along those lines. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that you said staff doesn't permit um, eucalyptus trees now and that you, you got direction from council, you know, they ought to be prohibited. I don't think that's the only tree we should prohibit. I think, you know, most of the trees that you've already named um, with the addition of camper trees should also be prohibited because they're just, you know, not only are they not native, but, you know, the damage they cause, you know, constant um, uh, upkeep, damage to sidewalks and all those things, you know, the leaves that they drop. There's a constant maintenance problem. So I would like to see that we have a proposed list of trees that, that ought to just be prohibited from being planted. Okay, Mr. Uh, Olbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one question about uh, process, Bob. Um, are you looking for us to tee up ideas that we'd like to see staff come back with now, or are you going to do that in a later phase of this discussion? No, I think that's what we're doing now. It's just a study session because we're not going to be doing anything past that. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. I have one question and then some specific things I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to follow up on. Uh, sparked by the uh, comments you, you yourself made a minute ago, Mr. Mayor. Um, Greg, is there a reason why we have to focus on species of trees here? For example, um, and leaving aside the notion of what constitutes a heritage tree, which I'm not trying to disabuse the fact that that's, that's an important consideration for me, but, you know, hypothetically, could we define it in terms of uh, an undesirable tree or a tree that's subject to removal as one that uh, causes significant sidewalk damage, that p is found to cause a significant risk of falling across a roadway? In other words, do it based on uh, uh, what the tree does as opposed to what species it is. Yeah, that certainly could be one of the criteria. Um, I, I think the way the ordinance is worded now with the, with the species was probably on the other side, which trees are worth protecting as opposed to which trees we don't want to have um, in our, um, on sidewalks or medians or, or in uh, areas that might cause damage. So we certainly could look at it from that side as well. The reason I ask, by the way, is because historically, as we all know, um, uh, at one point, people thought eucalyptus trees were a really great idea to plant around here. And then after we lived with them for a while, we said, oh, that wasn't such a good idea. Um, and, 
and yet they fit certain definitions where we had to be careful about how we acted on them. Whereas if there were a way without spending a lot of time to redraft the ordinance so it focused on what the tree does as opposed to what its species is, then that might be a more robust long-term solution. Um, in terms of specifics, uh, uh, I would like to see uh, stronger protection than I think we have currently for heritage <coughs> trees, however we end up defining that, limited number of species uh, on private property with uh, development. I'm actually personally supportive of the idea that, that since that's a benefit to the community, if there needs to be some kind of financial compensation to the property owner or to assist them, if there's a way to do that, assist them to work around it so that the tree can be preserved, I'm certainly willing to consider that. I don't think we should just be taxing people because they happen to have a tree that we want to preserve on their property. Um, and then um, I, I am interested in, if there's a simple way of doing it, of modifying the rules so that if, in, at least in the planter strip, if there's a tree that was planted there by the city and it causes damage, that the city is responsible for repairing the sidewalk damage or the curb damage or whatever it is. Now, if a property owner like me, if I plant, I planted a couple of trees in the planter strip because I wanted them there for, for aesthetics, uh, that's on me, okay? Um, uh, and I don't know whether procedurally you could do that. It might mean you'd have to keep track of who owned which trees, which might be problematic. But that's, that's a direction I'd like to see us go in because I think that if the public's benefiting from it and we paid to put it there, it just seems odd to stick the property owner with the bill for repairing something. It turns out, well, we put the wrong kind of tree in. Sorry. Please repair it for us. Okay. Mr. Grokop, last comments? Yeah, just a couple of things on, based on what Mark said. Uh, the, the last thing he said, I'm in total agreement with. Um, if we planted it as a city, we should take care of it um, and any damage it does. But the idea of talking about, you know, writing the ordinance in some way about, <clears throat> in terms of what a tree does, the, there is a problem with that because we immediately think of the eucalyptus and there are shallow roots and the branches, the way they grow, and they snap off and kill people. But if you look at a valley oak and the way a valley oak grows, it likes to grow up and, and then once it gets to a certain size, it likes to grow its branches back down to the ground. It um, doesn't work too well as a street tree or anywhere close to the public right away, so it's a danger. Yet we have them and we protect them. And Rosie, the tree out there on whatever street that was, uh, Garnett, I think it was. Ruby. Uh, yeah, on the corner of Ruby and, and Eaton. Um, it's a dangerous tree. You look at how the branches grow. And so in, the, in that case, Mark, we have to look at how do we cohabitate with these trees that were here before us and before we start building homes and streets and roads all around them. So um, I th think that might be a little difficult for staff to come up with something like that is my comment on that. Okay. So does staff have some direction to uh, come back with a whole bunch of different things? You'll have that next meeting, right? <laughs> no, there's, there's a lot of variables in this. I, like I said, I appreciate the, the comments that everyone's made, and it's 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 a big it's a big topic, and I, I think we you know might it's going to take more than a couple of meetings to get get it all fine tuned. So, thank you very much to staff for doing the work they have, and for the future work that they do. All right, we'll move on to. Uh, Thank you. We'll move on to 7A, which is the business consideration of adopting a resolution authorizing the City of San Carlos to continue working with other jurisdictions in the county to address the housing crisis on a regional basis, including through ongoing support of San Mateo County's Home for All initiative. Mr. Sade. Good evening once again, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. In 2015, the County Board of Su Supervisors convened a task force of community leaders to identify regional housing issues and, among other things, to develop an action plan to preserve and increase housing for all income levels in our county. Home for All initiative was developed by this task force and you are now being asked, along with 20 other cities in the county, to adopt a resolution in support of this initiative. Here to provide more in-depth discussion is Jessica Stanfill Mullen, Management Analyst with the City or the San Mateo County Manager's Office, and uh, so I'll turn it over. Welcome, Jessica. How are you? 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to come and present on our Home for All initiative. And I just want to start off by saying that I am joined uh, uh, here tonight with, by Peggy Jensen. She is our Deputy County Manager for the County of San Mateo, as well as um, by Ken Cole, who is the Director for the Department of Housing. And as, uh, as Al mentioned, we are here to provide you with an update about the Closing the Jobs Housing Gap Task Force and the new initiative that we launched uh, this past fall called the Home for All San Mateo County, and we're asking that you consider adopting the resolution tonight um, supporting the Home for All initiative moving forward. Before we talk about Home for All, I just want to provide some information about the housing crisis that we're facing here as a region in San Mateo County. Between 2010 and 2014, the county added approximately 54,000 new jobs. However, we only managed to add an, an additional 2,100 units of housing. So for every one unit of housing that was built, we added 26 new jobs, which means that our workforce is having a hard time finding um, homes that are close close to their jobs. Additionally, some of the challenges that we face in San Mateo County um, are made by some of our values and decisions. Um, the majority of our land is preserved open space in agriculture. That's a value that we hold in San Mateo County. However, that means we only have about 25% of the land that's been developed that we can um, look at in terms of how do we add more units of housing. And if you were to look, to look at our current housing stock within the county, approximately two-thirds of that is single-family homes. So thinking about innovative solutions um, and creative um, ideas of how we use that uh, current housing stock to come up with solutions um, to address this crisis. Additionally, I think everybody here is aware of the current um, um, steep increases that we've seen in average market rent. Um, this graph here sort of demonstrates the stark, uh, stark increase that we've seen over the past five years. The average um, two-bedroom condo or two-bedroom apartment in 2010 um, went for uh, $2,000, as well as a one-bedroom for $1,750. And if you compare that to five years later, we are seeing um, average rents for a two-bedroom increase to uh, over 2,800 a month, and for a one bedroom, over 2,500 a month. Additionally, we witnessed the same, oops, sorry, the same increase in housing and condo prices. Where in 2009, the average house um, was approximately $800,000, with the average condo being 500. And if you look um, forward six years later, um, uh, the co uh, average cost of a home increased to 1.25 million, while condo increased to 700,000. Additionally, we are experiencing um, um, a large amount of increase in traffic congestion since a majority of our workforce is forced to look sort of outside the county for options in terms of housing. Uh, this graph will sort of demonstrate of our 340,000 jobs that we have in San Mateo County, approximately two-thirds of our workforce are commuting from outside. And while the blue uh, orange and brown pie wedges sort of showcase the workforce that are coming from our neighboring counties of San Francisco, Santa Clara, and Alameda County. Um, what's really interesting is that purple pie wedge where we have 77,000 workers coming in from counties beyond that. So that is the North Bay, that is parts of the Central Valley, as well as um, down south in terms of Monterey. Additionally, one of the things that we have heard from our community partners is the impacts that we are having to our businesses. Uh, the Silicon Valley, Valley Leadership Group does an annual survey of their CEOs and they have um, identified housing costs as the number one business challenge that our CEOs in Silicon Valley are, are, have been facing for the past four years. And last year, the Bay Area Council did a poll of Bay Area residents and they found that 34% of, of uh, respondents to that poll had indicated that they were likely to leave the Bay Area due to the um, high cost of housing. Sorry. So from that, um, as Mr. Seve mentioned, in the spring of 2015, the Board of Supervisors held a study session to sort of identify options and ways in which we could address this housing crisis at a local level. And they identified 29 different policies and programs that they either had enacted or were looking to enact, as well as looking at their funding commitments that they have made over the past five years. Uh, the county has invested approximately $64 million in funding, with the majority of that going to housing development, as well as $13 million each going towards housing preservation and improvement, as well as $13 million for homeless, homelessness prevention and support. 
And while uh, the county has been making great strides into sort of addressing this crisis, they felt that it was important to really engage our community members to sort of talk through um, this crisis and see if there were options in which we could all come together to work on this issue. So from that, they convened the, the Jobs Housing Gap Task Force from September 2015 through June of 2016. It was co-chaired by Supervisor Horsley and Supervisor Slocum. We had 55 participants with representatives from each of the 20 cities and towns. We want to thank Councilmember Collins for diligently being there uh, once a month very early in the morning and attending all of our meetings. Um, we also had participants from large employers and business groups um, such as Facebook, Genentech, LinkedIn, Google, as well as our Chambers of Commerce, our educational and um, transportation partners, as well as developers, community-based organizations, and labor. And the idea of bringing uh, this task force together was to sort of learn about the challenges created by the current housing market, um, work together to develop a menu of solutions that jurisdictions could consider in terms of what works best for their, for their communities in terms of addressing this problem, and then commit to taking action to implement these solutions. And the task force really looked at the challenges um, facing their communities and organ organizations and um, tried to identify a range of tools, best practices, and solutions in five key areas areas, looking at ways to address the problem in our low density housing um, in the residential neighborhoods, looking at high density housing options along our transit corridors and in the downtown areas, looking at ways in which we could advocate and um, identify additional funding opportunities for affordable housing, looking at the continuum of housing needs in terms of homelessness, preservation, and displacement, and then identifying creative strategies for community engagement. And from their work, we have four key outcomes from the task force. The first of which is an action plan, which I will discuss further on, which sort of identifies um, areas in which we can continue to work on this issue moving forward. The second of which is the Home for All website, which sort of serves as an online community resource center for either elected officials, staff, or residents that sort of want to learn more about the crisis, its impacts on our community, and sort of um, um, find out uh, the um, innovative solutions and options that jurisdictions could consider that um, reside in our 15-piece toolkit that is on our website. Um, and um, we also have sort of a current progress checker which sort of identifies um, the leadership that cities have taken to sort of address this issue through policies and programs. The third area is our public is doing a, launching a public relations and education campaign, going out to the community, educating, educating them about the crisis and options in which to address this issue um, and having them become more engaged in these conversations. And then the last of which is um, building partnerships and doing that um, more in-depth community engagement to sort of make sure that we have all the voices at the table when talking about this issue. And it was really the task force that asked us to continue this work. They didn't want to produce a white paper that sat on a shelf. They wanted to continue to build upon the momentum that had been established by the task force and keep moving this forward. And they've asked us to launch the Home for All San Mateo County Initiative which we did this past fall. And the mission of the Home for All initiative is to establish a climate in San Mateo County where diversity of housing is produced and preserved so that we have a future where everyone in San Mateo County has an affordable home with the outcome that the county will be a culturally, generationally, and diverse community with housing for all. And how we're proposing to sort of um, achieve these, um, this mission, vision, and outcome is to, uh, is to move this initiative forward through a structure where we have a steering council, which um, Council Member Collins, we appreciate, um, serves on that council for us, um, which can sort of provide overall guidance and direction to staff in terms of how we should address this issue. And then working on this through four key work groups really I, um, address the, the major hurdles that we have and challenges that we have in our community to building more housing. The first of which is outreach and education, sort of again going out into the community, educating them about the problem, having them become more engaged in, in the conversations within our communities. The second is funding. We know that funding from the state and federal, federal government is somewhat limited right now for housing, so looking at innovative solutions that we can do here locally, how can we le leverage our current resources. 
The third is legislation and policy, making sure that jurisdictions have enacted legislation that allows them to be flexible and move quickly in terms of when new um, and creative housing solutions emerge, as well as working with our state and federal leg legislators, um, talking to them about the work that's being done here, seeing if there are options and ways in which we can partner with them to identify additional funding and tools that jurisdictions could could use to address this issue. And the last of which is mobility. Sort of working with our transit um, agencies to sort of identify um, best practices or models to sort of address the mobility. Um, concerns that are associated with housing, as well as looking at creative solutions for first mile, last mile, making sure that our, um, our um, future developments are walkable and bikeable. Additionally, the Home for All um, initiative will sort of tackle that action plan that was set forth by the, um, by the task force. And the action plan sort of focuses the work in four key areas. The first of which is building partnerships and community support. So we're going out to all of our jurisdictions, asking them to be part of this solution and part of this conversation moving forward by passing the Home for All resolution. We've been um, working with our stakeholders, clergy, environmental groups, um, foundations, sort of talking to them about ways in which they can be part of this solution and again continuing that large employer business outreach as well as the local um, chambers of commerce and having them be engaged um, in, this, in this effort. The second area is sort of looking at supporting all types of housing development. Um, so as I've mentioned before, we've created our Home for All website, um, which sort of serves as that tool for our community to learn more about housing and creative solutions. The second idea is a second unit center. If uh, residents are interested in learning more about how do you go about building a second unit, what are some options, um, design templates, things that they could consider, that would sort of serve as a one-stop shop for folks looking to, to identify um, or sort of learn more about that process. And then the third area is, do, is uh, developing a, a process for facilitated community meetings, sort of how can we get more folks engaged and sort of identify those concerns that they have with housing early on um, in the process. Our third area, again, is looking at funding for affordable housing. Um, how can we make HART, which is our Housing and Regional Endowment uh, Trust, um, more um, innovative and um, sort of more dynamic? Um, the conversations that happened at the task force were the, um, inspired the board to look at options, funding options, with what we could do locally here um, to be able to provide funding for, for affordable housing. And that um, prompted uh, the board to, um, to propose the Measure A's tax extension on the ballot um, this past November. Additionally, looking at a shared um, housing credit legislation, um, if jurisdictions were to contribute to a housing trust such as HART, um, would, if there was a shovel-ready shovel ready affordable housing project in another jurisdiction, um, if that funding were to go to support that jurisdiction uh, or that project in another jurisdiction, would the contributing jurisdiction um, be able to get some type of credit for building that housing? not all, but some type in terms of in regards to the arena. And then lastly, um, the conversations um, on the task force also helped establish the Affordable Rental Housing Preservation Fund, which the board passed uh, last June. And then the final area is really looking at how do we secure land and strengthening our community infrastructure. Um, we know that HART has already looked at available public land analysis, um, sort of how, you know, um, working with our school districts as well to see if they have options for uh, developing housing for their staff and their teachers as well. And then going out and working on regional options to enhance transit and making sure that we have energy and water efficient development moving forward. So some of the work that we've done um, in regards to the Home for All initiative, again, we were partnering, um, asking city councils to partner with us, uh, working with our faith-based community, reaching out to foundations and environmental groups, providing support and information for school districts, and then engaging our business community. Additionally, we've, uh, we've uh, developed a number of resources, such as our Home for All website, as well as brochures and talking points for community engagement. These are the um, number of jurisdictions that have already adopted the Home for All resolution, um, including the county. We have 10 jurisdictions that have already adopted the, the resolution, as well as CCAG. And we have a number of jurisdictions coming up that we'll be considering it as well. 
And what the resolution is asking is that the City of San Carlos will continue to commit to working with other jurisdictions in this county to address the housing crisis on a regional basis, including ongoing support of the Home for All San Mateo County Initiative. That concludes my update, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. It's a big problem. Um, Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll keep my comments brief. Just first of all, thank you, uh, Jessica. What a monumental uh, effort this has been, and thanks to Ken as well, and everybody from the county office and housing. Um, I got to tell you, this is probably the biggest and best learning experience that I've had on any topic since I've been on the council. I'm on a lot, and we're all on a lot of boards and commissions, JPAs, and that sort of thing. But getting our arms around this has been a very long process, and I think it all starts with education. Um, I can't tell you how many discussions I have. It's just, probably housing comes up more than any other topic that I talk with people on the street or uh, on the phone or just I meet at various social functions. Uh, when they bring up traffic and they bring up parking, I bring up housing. <laughs> so, it, and the, the process to, to educate people on how interconnected all these things are and how important it is that they look past the fact that we're building a four and a five story apartment building close to downtown or close to the tracks is really important. And it, it takes a while, but people finally start to understand what we're trying to do. And it's very important that we just, that we continue um, th this effort. Uh, and I just want to say thank you again. It's been, I, I didn't have very high hopes. I just thought there was a room full, full of people there and I thought we were going to be spinning our wheels. But it was nice to see the, the process play itself out. I also want to thank the County Board of Supervisors for all the work that they've done in getting, was it Measure K on the ballot and getting it passed. Um, I'm not sure there's really much more important work we do in this city and this county than to make sure that there is housing for people who want to uh, live here. They, and they want to live here because they work here. And what was it, 46,000 people drive mm -hmm. from other counties outside the Nine Bay Area counties to get here every day? That's uh, 77,000. 77,000. Yeah. I don't know how many cars that is. It's, maybe it's not 77,000 cars, but it's a lot of cars. in place, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So anyway, thank you again for all your work. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Collins. Mr. Albert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation. This is a topic kind of near and dear to, to my heart as well, and I'll echo Ron's comments about thanking everybody for the, the work on it uh, that's being done, because there's a lot of work that has to be done. Um, the, the, the housing crisis always reminds me of, in San Mateo County, always reminds me of uh, a famous quote from Winston Churchill when he was commenting on, on uh, the United States of America. And he said, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing, pause, after they have exhausted every other possible alternative they could possibly think of. Um, and I frankly think that's where we are with, with housing. I think uh, it's... Everybody I've ever talked to, it's pretty obvious what some of the, uh, what the parameters of the solution set are. Mm -hmm. um, it's just nobody wants to go there. Um, and um, uh, I have a f suggestion about that, but before I get to that, I did want to ask you, um, I had heard someplace that nationwide, San Mateo County is like number one or number two on the list of, I think of it as the most mismatched county between housing and employment. It is. I will look into that. I, okay. I've heard that um, San Mateo County is one of the most expensive counties to live in the United States, but we can we can follow up on that mismatch. This one was talking more about the notion of how many people come in and out of, of the county. Um, well, what's the, um, given your expertise in this area, what's, if we don't do enough, what's likely to happen? I mean, I, I, at some point, do employ, does employment just flee San Mateo County and what, we become a bunch of farms and old people sitting around going, gee, it used to be great here, but too bad? Well, if I can, um, if I can be honest, I think you all have heard the stories about what could happen because it's currently happening right now. Um, we know that families are being torn apart, um, that, um, that um, families that, um, you know, Kids that grew up here can't afford to live here, so they are moving with their children um, into different um, areas of the country um, so that parents cannot be close to their, their kids or their grandchildren. Uh, we have seen that um, 
we have a, a teacher crisis in a, in a number of school districts here because teachers um, aren't being able to find affordable options um, to be able to stay here or they're commuting very long hours. We have heard anecdotally um, from businesses, but we've also seen it in the newspapers about how um, there are businesses that are looking to relocate into other more affordable areas because they're, um, they're having a hard time retaining and recruiting individuals to come to this Bay Area. This is a crisis that we know affects everybody. Um, and if, um, if we, we feel that we've come up with a menu of solutions uh, to be able to give options for folks who maybe want to stay in their community but downsize, uh, they could either do shared housing, they could move into a, a, an accessory dwelling unit um, and maybe rent out their home. That's one option. Um, there are um, middle housing, which sort of um, takes lots that are in, um, sort of going from residential neighborhoods into the downtowns. How can you make those more dense but still uh, can, you know, maintain that residential community charm? And then sort of really taking advantage of what's along the El Camino and our Barton Caltrain corridors by going more densely um, and looking at different options. Um, so it, it's something that I know every jurisdiction, and this is what we heard on the task force, every jurisdiction is facing this and they're hearing these stories. Um, and so we felt that if we provided a menu of options for people to consider that maybe we could, we could help with that problem. Well, let me give you uh, uh, one other thought to consider about not so much of an options on sets of solutions, but um, uh, I think one of the challenges you're facing is that even amongst the general public, when people are, conf are confronted with the issue, either personally because their child is one of the people who mm -hmm. can't live here or not, or they learn about it, um, Let's be honest here. It, what's really stopping the, sol the solutions from going forward are, is self-interest. Okay, it's. I, I always jokingly tell people that if, if I wanted to, you know, get myself recalled off of this dais tomorrow morning, I, I all I'd have to do is propose doing something where we'd uh, uh, change the land use regulations in San Carlos so that you could build apartment buildings or condos in places where there are just single-family homes now. It's just not tolerated. Okay. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason it's not tolerated is, I think, because people don't, until they confront it personally, they don't really understand the human cost of this. And so my suggestion to, to you guys actually is um, find ways to uh, dramatize the human cost of this. It, individuals, families that are being torn apart, whatever. Because, because you know, Despite what I said about self-interest, I also am a big believer in, in the fundamental goodness of most people, which is once they understand what the price is of their viewpoint, they will begin the process of adjustment. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to do that until it stares them right in the face of, okay, that's what it means. Okay? And there are lots of examples in history of that from, from uh, uh, where, where shifts in thought patterns began when people were forced to confront the human cost of, of a situation that they had been living with for a long time. So I'm not exactly sure how, the, how you do that. i um, be happy to talk to you about it offline, but find ways to dramatize the human cost as widely as possible so everybody's aware of it. And we are actually um, looking at working with consultants to refine our messaging as well as identify ways in which um, to build a dynamic community engagement process for this very, um, to address this very issue, to sort of educate the, the public about the impacts, um, sort of the consequences of, of not addressing this issue, um, and then sort of, ed and then additionally educating them about the solutions that are available. And, and I'll just make one last comment here. Um, Education is really important. Mm -hmm. Education in these kind of things is never enough because what you have to overcome is even when somebody intellectually understands it, when they're looking in the mirror in the morning, they have to look at themselves and go, do I really feel right about what I'm not letting happen? Okay. And until they get to that point, the education is not going to matter because they'll find ways to rationalize away. Okay. Other comments? Mr. Johnson? Mr. Rokot? Questions or anything? I'm okay. Yeah, just a couple of comments. Um, one is I just want to point out something on this, uh, these statistics that are given. Um, this one about congestion, mm -hmm. and it says, you know, 300 and approximately 340,000 jobs in San Mateo County, and 213,300 workers live outside the county. So what that would indicate then, the flip side of that is about 126,000 people uh, live and work in San Mateo County. They, mm -hmm. they work in the same county they live in. 
But I look at, for instance, my wife. She works for Stanford. So she's just barely crossing the line. Um, there's no way you can plan this. You can't tell people you will live and work in the county, in the same county. You know, there's people crossing the line all over the place. From You see the buses that uh, go from all the different high-tech uh, companies that you, 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 you know that's the answer that these companies have created is because you got all these young kids that uh, want to work for Google and Facebook and Netflix and whatever and but they want to live in San Francisco mm -hmm. or they want to live maybe in San Jose but primarily San Francisco so you see the buses in the afternoon loaded up and off they go <laughs> um, and so the, you know, I, I applaud that. I mean, these companies are addressing the issue and addressing what the market is asking for and providing it, which is great. But I, I think what I'm saying about this number is it's a little, I see it as a, a little disingenuous. This is not, this is not part of the crisis. Um, the fact that people choose to uh, work in a different county than they live is, is just their choice. I mean, you can't control it. You can't build enough uh, to, unless you start building walls and saying you, where you live is where you work. It's just, you know, it's just what it is. Um, the, the point to, I wanted to point to something that um, Mr. Robert said down here is about educating people and so forth. Um, he's right. If we started zoning single-family uh, neighborhoods into being higher density, there would be a hue and cry. But actually, truth be told, we've already done it. When we did our general plan, we took parts of this community that were single-family, and we uh, zoned them uh, for higher density. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily for, you know, high-rise buildings, but still, that's why we have the sideways buildings, and I, and I can tell you um, where I live, and, you know, I've lived for many, many years, um, when I consolidate all the years I've lived in San Carlos, most of them have been in the downtown core, and where I live right now, across the street, single-family house, is going to turn into a four-story apartment building, right smack next door to me, uh, is going to be a mixed use, so office with housing above it. Um, I won't get any morning sun, and I won't get any afternoon sun anymore. So you'll see this council member moving. I don't even know if I can stay in San Carlos when I move, but there's just no way, you know, a guy that grew up in the country is going to uh, live with a home where you don't get any natural light. It's just not going to happen. But that said, I agree with Mark that it's it really, you know, I've been on this dais for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And when I first got on this dais, guess what we were talking about? Housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, what I've learned in the 15 years I've been here is this housing crisis is caused by government. Because what we haven't done is zoned land properly. And there's... Uh, we've zoned and given the store to companies like Facebook and Google and so forth that want to build and be here when you said it. As it becomes less affordable, finally they'll wake up someday and say, you know what, San Mateo County, we, we've, our uh, uh, unemployment rate is 3%. Mm -hmm. Other places in the country would die to have 3 anywhere close to that, 6%. And yet, you go back to, uh, I keep alluding to Ohio, where I come from, you go back to Orville, Ohio, where uh, one of the towns where I'm familiar with, my brother lives there, it's a ghost town. So why aren't these companies, I know it's because of Stanford University and some of the education we have around here, and people come here and they like it and they want to they stay. There's other things that impact it, like uh, foreign uh, markets that want to come here and, and bring workers with them and so forth. So. I'm going to be voting against this, not because I'm opposed to thinking about it, but because I, I really think what we all need to do is, is zone better, and we could have done that a long time ago. And at some point, we have to just say, you know, let's not get greedy. We don't need every company in, the, in San Mateo County or in, in the Bay Area. Um, let, 
you know, spread the wealth around. Let these companies go to other places and, and uh, put up shop. And go to these communities that are dying on the vine. I mentioned Ohio, but I mean, there's parts of California you can go to, the same thing. It's a dust bowl. So that's going to be the answer. The market is going to be the answer. And that's why I'm, I'm not in favor of this, because I think the market is the answer. Not, not, you, you can't, and you can't control the market. And I appreciate your perspective, and I just want to um, point out that in our toolkit um, that that we have on the website, we do have some best practices and model ordinances um, that address some of those zoning concerns. And um, looking at um, like housing overlay zones, um, reduced parking requirements, there are things that um, that we are trying to share that information with jurisdictions so that they consider those things moving forward um, to make sure that we do have the right zoning in place to accommodate future growth. I was in this business <laughs> for 27 years. In 1977, when I got into it, people, I wouldn't say welcomed, but they certainly didn't protest when we built homes. By the time I, we closed our business in 2004, it was completely different, even in cities that we had built in many times before. It's a very, very difficult issue because people have things and you know, as, as Mr. Grocott alluded to, why do I want to lose my sunlight this way or the other way? Having said that, have we ever had a chance to, we have a general plan and certain, as was also said on the dais here, um, certain places in our town have um, ability to have overlays of higher units, 14 units to the acre, let's just say. Just, I'm picking a number out of the hat. Have we ever gone to every city, looked at their general plan and sort of and again, this is a technical question. I probably haven't had the time to do it, but maybe we can hire somebody from Stanford to do it and love to do it in the summertime. Add it all up and say, if we built this 14 here, if we built you know, 16 here, in other words, you could theoretically. If we ever added up all the units that we could have, I'm not sure it would match up what we have. You know what I'm saying? Right, not to my knowledge. No, okay, and I'm, and I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying, I'm not sure. I tend to agree with uh, Mr. Grocott in one sense, is that I'm not sure even if we added them all up, it would add up to what, you know, one-to-one -one or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And the other issue, unfortunately, is, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting to see the cities that have signed on to this, um, some of which I, I haven't seen their general plans, mm -hmm. but I don't think they have a lot of overlays. In some of the cities, and that's another difficult issue, is that some of the cities are fairly progressive and trying to match this up, and other cities, um, how can I put this politely, give lip service to doing it, but there's no way that they would ever, they would ever do it because they don't even have a general plan to do it, nor would they pass one. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a real difficult one. I'm going to support this. I think it's a great idea that we that we move ahead and try the darndest that we can. It'll never be one to one, but I think it, the the number that strikes me is that huge seventy seven thousand. That's like twenty five percent or whatever it is. I mean, I'd like to get, eventually get it down a little bit. And as as Matt said, it, not everybody's going to live and work in the same place. I agree with that. Some people are going to want to live somewhere else for whatever reason. But the, the numbers are just getting it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I I don't know. Um, I mean, we, we're building, uh, I don't know, 400 and how many units? Have we got 455 in the pipeline right now or even more? And it's a, you know, a, and then plus the affordability issue. We're, we're just talking about housing, and you didn't mention affordability. That's another whole mm -hmm. thing of how do, we, how do we allow for affordability. So anyway, uh, any other comments before we uh, move on here? Um, just a final, final comment. Right. Um, uh, one of the key components uh, to me in this whole thing is the shared housing credit. Um, you know, some cities can't meet their arena numbers, and, and if we can provide a vehicle through collaboration um, of all the cities in the county, um, allowing cities who just, like Atherton and Hillsborough, they don't, they don't have the there is no place that they can put that housing. And if there they, is. Well, maybe there's a little bit. They aren't going to do it. I mean, they're not gonna, okay, they're not going to do it. Yeah. But if there are other cities that are willing to help them out, uh, I think we should do it. And one of the things, I, I remember mentioning this at one of our task force meetings, it is important for all the councils in this county to make sure that the public knows that uh, how much of a problem that is. It, it's incumbent on us to be brave, to educate, and to take the steps to provide that housing because 
as you mentioned, if the houses, uh, if we don't build the housing, the employers will move elsewhere. Uh, the market, Matt, will speak. The market has already spoken. <laughs> Google came, chose to come here. Facebook chose to come here. Nobody forced them. Uh, all we're trying to do is play catch up. And I think that that's the important thing for us as council members, is that we need to tell the public, look, if you don't do this, your home values will suffer. Your rents will go up. You don't increase affordability in housing by not building more housing. It just continues to get more expensive. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be supporting this also, and, um, and I'm glad to hear the support on the council. Okay, I take a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, may I make one other comment? If I don't hear a motion, sure. <laughs> Everybody talk. Sir, go ahead. The, uh, uh, I, just responding to what, what Ron said, I'm going to support this too because I think whatever we can do, we, we need to do. Um, and and uh, the market uh, does not operate in housing. Everybody knows that. If we actually had free, unfettered market forces at work here, there would probably be no single-family homes in San Carlos because the land would all get turned over and built into higher-density housing because that's the highest use. Uh -huh. Somebody would be willing to come in and pay the money. We, we prevent that for quality of life reasons. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not suggesting otherwise. But it's, it's uh, not realistic to think that the market's ever really operated here. Um, but the the... the the, the point I wanted to make is, Ron, I agree with you about, as council members in, in all the cities, we need to educate people. But part of the problem is that in the self-interest of the individuals who are already here, when housing stock doesn't get built, the value of my home goes up. Okay? I'm actually better off by not building, by not building housing. That's a very self-interested way of looking at it, but there's a whole bunch of those forces there. That's why I was saying there needs to be some other way to get on a different angle to people saying, you know, how can you sort of feel good about yourself when these families are being torn up or whatever it is. Okay, I'll entertain a motion then at this time. Mr. Mayor, I will uh, move that we adopt Resolution 2017-14, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos authorizing the City of San Carlos to continue working with other jurisdictions in the county to address the housing crisis on a regional basis, including through ongoing support of San Mateo County's Home for All initiative. Second. All right, and I didn't um, do this, and I should have done it before. Uh, is anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Yes, please come up. And I'm going to hold you to two minutes, Bonnie. I support the resolution. I'm just curious as to how much Redwood City is taking on over there. They're building so many units. Are they helping us out? Are they above the average? I don't know. Well, they're building about 2,500 units as far as... I know, and they have, uh, and until they started building, I don't believe that they had a um, inclusionary ordinance. They may have one now. They still don't have one, Ken? Uh, they don't have the affordable housing requirement? Uh, they were given, the developers were given what they call density bonuses, yeah. so that uh, they would if they would build more into the housing and make them affordable, and if I'm if I'm mistaken there, please correct me. Um, but uh, I don't think that Redwood City is hurting the situation. You know, yeah, there might be some residents of Redwood City that might disagree, but well, there's a, well, they're building a lot of housing. Yeah, know, I, th I, I think it's great, but I, I, you know, it's downtown. It's near transportation. It's where it should be. And they have and, the capacity. Yeah, and, and as a homeowner. I, I sort of think of uh, what Mark said. You look at yourself in the mirror in the morning and you think how lucky you are because you have yours. Sure. And the other guy doesn't. But, you know, maybe I don't get popular with a lot of people for the things I say, but I think that the county ought to have a tax and we all as property owners pay toward a housing fund for low-cost housing. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay, so there's a resolution on the floor. Any further discussion? All right, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Groka? No. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Grisilli? Yes. And thank you, Jessica, and folks for coming out. Appreciate it. Give my best to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Our best to Kevin. <laughs> when you see him, if you see him. Whisper in his ear, housing, housing, housing. <laughs> okay.
So uh, we've gotten through the meat of the meeting. We need to go back to the consent calendar, uh, item 5D. So, um, Mr. Albert? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, actually, I have what may just be a very quick question on this, which mm -hmm. was um, I did not recall uh, this issue of going with Excella um, and the requirements for the agenda system being getting input from the council. Did we have a subcommittee that provided input on that? Or? No, there was no subcommittee for this. So th this was a staff-mediated process, right. basically. Okay. Um, uh, okay, well... I'm going to vote against it just because uh, the agenda management system is something that, as a council member, I have a pretty intimate role with, not as intimate as staff, um, and I would have liked an opportunity to provide some input on it um, before we actually were going to let the contract. Okay, so uh, 5D, uh, could I have a motion to approve this? Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a five-year agreement with a seller for an agenda man management system. Sir. All right, it's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, roll call, please. Councilman Collins? Yes. Councilman Gokat? Yes. Councilman Johnson? Yes. Councilman Obert? No. And Mayor Gosselli? Yes. All right, and the other one, I think, uh, Mr. Obert, is a G. Yes, uh, the question I had there uh, was I just wanted to understand the, the, a little bit more about the cost overrun essentially how it, it ended up being more than what we had anticipated. Um, I know there was another item on the consent agenda which was less on the sewer side, but it seems like, we're, we're, again, we're, we're sort of chasing the rabbit on, on our projections, and I'm just wondering if that's something we can adjust for. So I'd like a little color on. Grace, you have some information on that? Grace Lee, city engineer. Um, so after the bid, staff spoke with the contractor to see um, what some what might cause uh, the bids to be consistently high. And what we're hearing is um, the construction material, steel in particular, for is um, very uh, the price for steel went up quite a bit. And that's um, for a traffic signal. That's ma the majority of the material. That and also because of labor, um, very scarce um, labor around. Um, all the contractors are busy. And these are, uh, building a traffic signal is um, pretty specialized. There's a lot of skilled labor involved. Um, and that's why we're seeing a very high bid. Um, I appreciate that, that and that it hard, that doesn't surprise me. Um, I guess the question I'd have, is, or the, the thing I'd ask staff for, is perhaps when we're putting the budgets together for like future projects, that we can look at some of these trend lines and whatever we thought was the trend line, like pick a steeper one, because it, it seems like, you know, I, I, I'd like to be in a situation where sort of half of them end up being higher than we expected and half lower, and it seems like most of them are ending up higher. Um, uh, and and I'd like to try and avoid that. Just it's a better budgeting process that way. Okay. So I entertain a motion on this item. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt a resolution. Uh, can I just say I move to adopt 5G? Is that sure. sufficient? Second. All right. Moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none. Roll call, please. Councilmember Collins. Yes. Councilmember Gilcott. Yes. Councilmember Johnson. Yes. Councilmember Obert. Yes. Mayor Gasilli. Yes. All right. For the record, my mic wasn't on. Yes. <laughs> Moving on to eight council communications and announcements. Uh, who would like to go? If anyone, I'll just start at the right hand side here. Council Member Johnson. Uh, just one item I want to make folks aware of. Um, I was I had the pleasure to be at the farmers market um, two weekends ago with Jay and Grace. Um, I got a resident who brought up concern about um, parking in the Caltrain parking lot, and I actually received two other um, uh, similar inquiries via email. So there's sort of a confluence of a, a number of factors here. One, we uh, you used to be able to park on El Camino all day. We turned that into two-hour parking. Uh, you used to be able to park in the neighborhood all day. We created the parking permit program. Now there's also construction going on in the parking lot. So. I, I've reached out to Samtrans, and I made Al aware of this too. Um, but there are people who have bought parking permits for the Caltrain parking lot to commute to work, and they have no legal alternative um, for where to park. So frankly, like Caltrain has oversold the um, the number of parking permits. Um, so I, I think I just want to make people aware of it. I got I got an email reply from Brian Fitzpatrick. Um, it was not particularly uh, helpful. 
Um, one option that I, we had suggested is potentially talking to the Depot Cafe about um, renegotiating the spots there because one of the things that people pointed out is, um, hey, I'm trying to park, I'm, I'm trying to get to work, there's 15 spots for Depot Cafe, they're all empty, you know, this is d deeply frustrating. So anyway, I, I, well, to be, to, to TBD as to what the resolution is here, but um, I just wanted to make people aware if you get similar inquiries, um, I had reached out to, to Sam Trans. I'd asked Al to do the same thing. So that's all I got. Thank you. Mr. Grocott, anything? Yes. Um, I actually sent an email to the city manager about this, but I understand he's uh, out sick, so I haven't heard back. But um, the email was essentially saying, I go up Edgewood Road every day, and uh, with the rains and everything, you can see the collapse that's happening of the hillside, the upside of the hill. And years ago, the county put in cyclone fencing, but that is truly not a long-term solution. I would hope not. Even now, there's a um, large boulder that's up the hill a little bit that looks like if it gets undermined anymore, it's going to come tumbling down onto the road. And, um, you know, there's obviously the need for a capital improvement project along there. It's not our road. It's not, you know, Edgewood Park is not ours, but a good segment of our population commutes that way every morning uh, in and out, uh, well, out in the morning and in, in the evening, and it's dangerous. Um, and I think uh, what, I'm at, what I'd like to ask the council to consider is that we do some kind of recommendation resolution or a letter by the mayor that would go to their uh, public works department and inquire at least what's their plan, when do they intend to put in some type of uh, retaining wall structure to, um, to, to retain that, that hillside that's collapsing. So. Okay. Um, perhaps our public works director could contact Mr. Porter and, and just, you know, inform him probably writing a letter or someone just ask Jim. I know that they have had uh, loaders up there because I got stuck in those lines. They've been dig. I don't know if you noticed, but they've dug out a lot. This, this year they've dug out more than they've ever dug out. And, and I go up that road every day, practically every day too. So they've done a, they're trying to figure out which end is up on that. So maybe Mr. Porter might have some information. If he can write it to us or maybe come and, and talk to us about it, that'd be great. What their plan, what their plan is if there is a long range plan. Great, okay, thanks. Um, Mr. Olbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, just one thing, actually, Cameron, sparked by the comments you made, uh, you reminded me, I had meant to tell you that I had been approached by somebody who uh, had yet another dimension of concern about the Caltrain parking, which was with the uh, closing of part of the lots in San Carlos and Caltrain suggesting to folks that they go to Belmont. Um, this person was saying that that's really uh, terribly inconvenient and it may not, there may have been some problems with spaces there as well. Um, and my thought was, I mean, is this not something? Is that not something that the the uh, transit authority can talk can talk about, which you're on, or is, is that not part of their bailiwick? It's it's not part of their responsibility. Um, they don't own the parking lot. The parking lot's owned by the JPB. Um, but I did mention it to staff because they share the same staff, um, and I was sent to Brian Fitzpatrick. So. Okay, it just seems to me that maybe, I mean, the transit authority must have some oversight role, right? I mean, it, at least influence, probably more than we do. Is uh, not, no more than the fact that they share the same staff, so. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you. All right, Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, just one, one item as long as we're on, on the subject of Caltrain. I went to the... Uh, uh, electrification task force most recent meeting and uh, just one update Caltrain is going to be um, readjusting their schedule um, they're going to go to uh, 90 minute service um, both ways um, it's 60 minutes now during the middle of the day off off commute um, and that starts I believe in the summer and weekend they're going to keep weekend bullet trains but weekend service changes are going to start um, uh, in April, and those will also be uh, 90 minutes rather than one hour. So, look for some changes. Plus, uh, next month, uh, if, uh, if unless we get, unless the federal government cuts off funding, you should probably see infrastructure going up along the tracks, catenary poles, and and that sort of thing on the electrification. That's it. 
Okay, I just want to report that the um, Garbage JPB, of which there are 11 cities in the county, are we're working to uh, with Recology right now to see if we can uh, work on a contract which would extend their contract uh, starting in 2021. Um, a lot of that information, we have two or three groups of people working on that, and that will be coming to us probably in March or April. I think April they're going to be going out to all the cities and talking to us about different things that uh, hopefully they'll have agreed upon. And then, of course, each of us, each city has an opportunity to do a franchise agreement. Is that, I'm talking correctly here so far. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to let you know that that's, that's coming. Uh, staff uh, comments on city administrative business? No comments this evening. All right. Is there anything else, gentlemen? If not, meeting adjourned. Thank you.